<coughs> okay. So, uh, good morning in Pakistan and good afternoon in Beijing. Welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to the China Pakistan webinar. Our webinar is aimed at enhancing regional engagement and security under the Belt and Road Vision. And we are proud to uh, organize Center of China and Globalization uh, alongside Understanding China Forum to present to you an event that is aimed at building understanding, helping us find greater avenues of cooperation to be able to build the Belt and Road Vision in a more effective way. So a brief background, uh, we are going to understand uh, the Belt and Road, which was obviously announced in 2013 and has assumed center stage in China and Pakistan's bilateral cooperation vis-a-vis -vis the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. Since 2015, major projects, including transport and energy infrastructure, special economic zones, and the Gwadar port have substantially transformed Pakistan's economic potential. Moreover, in 2018, the scale and scope of CPEC was also further enhanced to include a socioeconomic dimension and also to expand coordination on green development, poverty alleviation, people to people connectivity, education, Recording and in progress. cooperation. Uh, as CPEC transitions towards the second phase, ensuring better use, utilization of CPEC projects, increasing incentives, and uh, also improving trade and investment, pursuing high quality and impactful development fostered the need for deepened dialogue and practical solutions as we move forward. And also it's very significant to understand that optimal utilization of the CPEC investments is possible through broader regional connectivity. So as China and Pakistan celebrate 70 years of establishment of diplomatic relations in 2021, this partnership stands at a historic and decisive juncture as well. There are global challenges, a global pandemic, and also uncertainty in the region, including neighboring Afghanistan. So how Beijing and Islamabad can utilize um, this opportunity, face the challenges to stimulate lasting solutions in the region is also going to be something we will discuss. And in the short and medium term, of course, people to people exchanges, timely progress under bilateral engagement and socioeconomic impact are focal on the agenda. Simultaneously coordinated efforts are required by both neighbors to reduce the possibility of humanitarian and security crises in the region at large. We are pleased and very honored to be joined by a panel from China, Pakistan, and also uh, outside of China and Pakistan that have experience in the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor and various fields. So an all-encompassing uh, discussion is going to follow. Uh, firstly, we have with us a President of Center of China and Globalization, Dr. Wang Huiyao. He's also Counselor to the State Council of the PRC. And then we have Senator Mushahid Hussain, who has sent his remarks. Uh, he is Chairman of Senate's Defense Committee, Pakistan. Then we have Ambassador Moinul Haq, Ambassador of China to Pakistan, Ambassador Riaz Koker, former Foreign Secretary of Pakistan, and we're also pleased to warmly welcome Ambassador Masood Khalid, former Ambassador of Pakistan to China, John Pao Zhong, Chairman of C and CEO of China Overseas Sports Holding Company, COPEC, Mr. Hassan Daud, Chairman KP Board of Investment, former Project Director of CPEC. Mr. Wang Zahai, Director of Pakistan China Center Skoda Chengdao. Uh, Mr. Mustafa Heather Sayed, who is Executive Director of Pakistan China Institute. Mr. Ben Harburg, Managing Partner, MSA Capital. Mr. Johnson Liu, Schwartzman Scholar and CEO of Ripe Consulting. And for the second part of our discussion, which is going to look at the region and challenges and common solutions, we have with us Mr. Imtiaz Gul, who is a known foreign policy analyst and expert. We have with us Professor Chen Feng, from the, uh, from the Tsinghua University's uh, National, uh, National Strategy Institute. And also we have Mr. Ijaz Heather, who is another known voice in Pakistan, and he will talk about the region and common challenges as well. So this is our event for today. My request for all of our participants is please to make sure that you are muted while other speakers are speaking and uh, enjoy the discussion. We are looking forward to your feedback, your comments, and also learning from your experience. So now, without further ado, I would like to warmly welcome President of the Center of China and Globalization, Mr. Dr. Wang Huiyao, who will give welcoming remarks. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Dr. Ajay. Thank you, Dr. Ajay. Thank you, Dr. Ajay. Thank you, Dr. Ajay. Thank you, Dr
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Zoom, and uh, Your Excellency, uh, Excellencies, Senator Mashad Hossein, Ambassador Morning Hawk, Ambassador Riza Hawker, all of our distinguished uh, participants, ladies and gentlemen. It's really an immense honor and pressure for me to welcome all of you on behalf of the Center for China Globalization uh, to today's forum. Uh, today's forum actually is a focus on China, Pakistan, the way forward enhanced regional engagement and security and the Belt and Road Initiative. The year 2021 actually is a significant year for the friendship between China and Pakistan. As we mark the 70th anniversary since the establishment of diplomatic ties between our two brother, brother nations, I can say with confidence that we have had an exceptional cooperation, deep trust and mutual understanding and have actually consistently supported one another among major shifts on the global and regional frontiers. Pakistan indeed holds a very special place in the hearts and minds of Chinese people, as I know this feeling is mutually. Thus, as we mark the beginning of a new chapter in this extraordinary relationship between people on both sides, we look forward to the next 17 years as we continue on the path of strengthening this friendship step by step and generation after generation. In reality, the relationship between people on both sides dates back millennia uh, from <laughs> uh, Grandaha civilization, then the prosperous Silk Road, and even today as modern nation states, we continue on this path. Uh, the Karaho Rome Highway and various other infrastructure projects have over the years served to deepen connectivity to bring our two peoples together. Although I haven't really uh, uh, visited uh, <laughs> Pakistan yet, but back, back in the 80s and uh, you know, uh, part of the 90s, I, when I was working at MoveCom, I remember working closely with Chinese companies and the uh, Pakistan counterpart uh, on some of the you know, contracting projects uh, that we had in Susan and, and we shared together. So that experience has constantly uh, drawn me to learn more about, about Pakistan and how we can uh, continue to expand our cooperation for the benefit of the people and beyond. So at CCG, uh, uh, Center for China Globalization, our vision is really to connect China and the world. And Pakistan is a key partner and close friend of China. So given the unique friendship and warmth we share, serve as a source of inspiration uh, for our work. So project by project, generation after generation, advocating principles for peaceful coexistence and pro proactively working towards improvement of, of each other and our people, we have in those seven decades certainly achieved various noteworthy milestones. Today, the key part, as a key partner of the Belt and Road Initiative and the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor since 2015, Unsurveying efforts from both sides have actually successfully led to the completion of phase one. So this included energy and transport infrastructure, special economic zones, and uh, 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 the uh, Guantanamo uh, port project. So in fact, our distinguished speakers today included many key contributors to the success really recording in progress. To learn more from our uh, from their experiences. Now, as we are entering into the second phase, uh, the key question is how to move forward. How can we ensure that the first phase of development, which has enhanced the capacity, improved the avenues of a cooperation, led to the further prosperity? How ordinary people can gain maximum benefit because in the end, the real success of a BRI and CPAC is really improved quality of life for the people. So as we celebrate the 70 years of exemplary friendship, this is also an important opportunity for us to plan ahead, working together and to find even more ways to enhance the scope and impact of the vision that we share. So this is also a critical time for us to address regional challenges. We all know that the security and humanitarian situation in Afghanistan and even other parts of the world requires collective action and goodwills about. Humanity has shared future as the two neighbors with deep understanding and aptitude to work together, China and Pakistan can also play a conductive role towards the stabilizing 
offering greater opportunities in the entire region. Eventually, the CPAC's real potential is to act as an enabler and also of heightened ex exchanges between Central Asia. So today we are also pleased to be joined by experts who can help address those common uh, opportunities and the challenges we face. And of course, we can also help understand how we can work collectively to propose and promote lasting solutions. And ladies and gentlemen, at, at the heart of BI and also CPAC uh, is connectivity. And in that, China has actually openly invited all countries of the world to participate in the Belt and Road Initiative. As President Xi actually said that during his recent uh, summit with President Biden, that all initiative from China is open uh, to the world, uh, including the US. So we hope that we can contribute together to the shared destiny as a humankind. So, uh, so CPAC can serve as a successful, I think that a demonstration on the cooperation under the Belt and Road Scheme for, for other countries. Now our discussion today is essentially aimed at uh, finding solutions, mutual friendship, and the furthering last peace in for China, Pakistan, and other countries at large. So today the Belt and Road Initiative is already aimed at enhancing people-to-people -people exchanges and uh, bound. We need to shift away from zero-sum mindset towards multiple understanding, mutual understanding, towards a new era that is inclusive and is based on the principle of peaceful coexistence. So even the COVID-19 pandemic, during which China and Pakistan exhibit immense support for each other, has demonstrated how important it is for the world to unite and really come together to address global challenges. We live in a global village, and the only way forward is through collective action. So I wish uh, today's forum immense success and the big impact and hope to visit Pakistan uh, very soon to, to really firsthand to see our successful project there. So I hope to see you in person and I really hope that uh, the today's this webinar were a big success. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Wang. Uh, that was Dr. Wang Huiyao, who is president of Center for China and Globalization. And uh, I think exactly uh, the main idea is that we are discussing China and Pakistan's cooperation. We're discussing CPEC, the BRI, but this is a conversation that's relevant to really all regions in the world. How can countries cooperate? How can we move towards better mutual understanding and enhancing improve lives for people, which is at the heart of this vision. Thank you so much. Now we move to the next part of our webinar, which is the special addresses. We have, first of all, Senator Mushahid Hussain Sayed, who, uh, who really requires uh, no introduction. He's a known uh, personality. He has been a, an advocate of friendship between China and Pakistan. He is chairman Senate Defense Committee. And between 2015 and 2018, he also served as chairman parliamentary committee on China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. Uh, he is also a leader of Pakistan's delegation to the United Nations Human Rights Commission at Geneva previously. And he's uh, the founding chairman of Pakistan China Institute, which is the first think tank in Pakistan devoted to Pakistan-China relations and relations with the region. So uh, Senator Mushahid Hussain is actually traveling currently. He has shared his remarks, uh, his warm uh, and encouraging remarks to really set the stage for the remaining discussion. So let's listen to Senator Mushahid Hussain Sayyid's remarks on the topic of China-Pakistan, the way forward. Hey, hello, and good afternoon to friends in China and good morning to friends in Pakistan and greetings to all the distinguished ladies and gentlemen who are at this forum organized by the Center for China and Globalization and Understanding China Forum, focusing on the Belt and Road Initiative and its centerpiece and flagship, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, CPEC, which is already a success story in its first phase, and now it is entering the second phase of its development. Uh, with the support of the people of China and Pakistan and the governments of both countries. Ladies and gentlemen, this forum is being held at a very historic timing because the pandemic coronavirus for the last two years, which has been raging all over the world, which is a common threat to humanity, has largely been put under control first by China and now by Pakistan as well. And we salute 
how China handled the coronavirus pandemic, especially the spirit of Wuhan, the 76 day Wuhan lockdown last year. And then China gave support to friends and neighbors like Pakistan through equipment, through testing kits, through ventilators. And uh, in fact, uh, there was an air corridor between uh, Pakistan and China where goods were being transferred, medical supplies from uh, China to Pakistan on a regular daily basis. So we appreciate that China has not only contained, curbed and controlled the coronavirus pandemic in its own country, but it's sharing uh, its vaccines as a global public good. And I and my family also have got the Sinopharm uh, vaccine along others uh, have got uh, CanSino, Sinovac. So it's been a success story, not just for Pakistan, but the world over. The second important context in which this uh, seminar webinar is being held is the change in Afghanistan. It's a historic change. It's uh, marking the end of the American century, which was supposed to begin after World War II, 1945. And I think which formally ended on 15th of August, 2021, with the humiliating defeat and exit of the American troops. And it's not just a defeat for uh, the United States, it's a defeat also for NATO and defeat for wrong policies that were based on use of force because this so-called war on terror has been devastating for the region. In Afghanistan, it cost $2.2 trillion. It led to the deaths of a quarter of a million people. $300 million were pumped in every day in Afghanistan. And 80,000 bombs, missiles, and drones were dropped on Afghanistan in the last 20 years. And Pakistan has been facing the consequences of these wrong policies because we have been fighting our own inland war on terror successfully, where over 80,000 Pakistani soldiers and civilians were martyred. And we are still hosting the largest number of refugees for the longest duration in history. So ladies and gentlemen, how do we move forward in this context? A changed context for the region, for Pakistan and China, and for the world. Number one, the way forward is not conflict and confrontation. The way forward is cooperation and connectivity. And I was recently uh, in Glasgow for the COP26 conference on uh, climate change. And I mentioned in my speech how China has taken leadership on this issue as well, apart from coronavirus pandemic. And I mentioned President Xi Jinping's pledge not to build coal-fired plants in the foreign countries in the future. So I think that this is a, a very important step forward. China is showing leadership in climate change as it is showing leadership in other countries. And the way forward is not a reversion to a Cold War mindset, as some people are seeking in the West. We reject such a mindset because Asia, after decades of conflict, after decades of strife, after failed and flawed policies, can no longer return to that mindset that seeks to control, that seeks to have block politics, that seeks to uh, contain countries, and that seeks returning to the Cold War by roping in other countries and forming alliances. So this kind of policies are rejected and failed. And that is why I said that AUKUS, the Australia, UK, US uh, alliance is also a, a wrong initiative at a wrong time. It's divisive and uh, it's dangerous because it will have other consequences. Uh, and, uh, and frankly, it's not part of Asia. It's something uh, which takes it part uh, outside Asia also and goes against the grain of the Asian century which seeks connectivity through economy, energy, ports, pipelines, roads, and railways, which is what the Belt and Road Initiative of President Xi Jinping uh, is all about, which is probably the most important diplomatic and uh, developmental initiative in the 21st century. Ladies and gentlemen, 2021 also marks the 70th anniversary of Pakistan-China diplomatic relations. And this is a historic anniversary because this is a unique relationship 
it has no precedent in the annals of international relations. It is neither transactional, nor tactical, nor directed against any third country. It is based on mutual benefit, bilateral cooperation, which seeks to stabilize the region that we link with. And I think this relationship is a model for other countries to follow. And both countries, Pakistan supports China's core interests, whether it's the issue of Tibet, Taiwan, Xinjiang, Hong Kong, South China Sea, and China also supports Pakistan on its core interests. So it is a mutually reinforcing relationship. And at the core of this relationship, ladies and gentlemen, is the people to people bonding. I remember I went to China first as a teenager. I was a college student. I was a regular listener to Radio Peking. This was the early 70s. Um, it was the days of the Cultural Revolution, the China of Chairman Mao, China of Premier Zhou Enlai, the China of Marshall Chu. The, so I've seen China's development. Then I saw the China of Deng Xiaoping reforming, opening up, and now we are seeing the China of President Xi Jinping, which is, uh, <clears throat> unlike the past, <clears throat> neither weak nor poor. And China is standing up and uh, China's peaceful development is a source of strength for countries in the region, especially Pakistan, because China believes in the UN Charter, China believes in the five principles of peaceful coexistence, and China upholds international law. Coming to the present situation, uh, we are very happy that CPEC is now entering the second phase. Uh, the JCC was held in September, and both sides reaffirmed their commitment to promote, preserve, and protect the China-Pakistan economic corridor. And this reaffirmation was done at the highest level when the president of China, President Xi Jinping, called the prime minister of Pakistan. And they discussed, and they said that CPEC will drive the Pakistan-China relationship in the future. And last week, we were very heartened that the CPEC authority in Pakistan hosted the leaders, the CEOs of 70 Chinese companies which are working in Pakistan. So that is extremely important. And the Board of Investment, which oversees the special economic zones, has also been overhauled. They have a new leadership. And I think the new leadership of CPEC Authority, the new leadership of the Board of Investment in Pakistan, has injected fresh blood and has rejuvenated dynamism into taking CPEC forward at the stage and the speed that we had initially decided. As chairman of the Parliamentary Committee on CPEC, uh, I was uh, uh, it, taking the initiative at the launch of CPEC. And during that period, we saw uh, building the first phase of CPEC. And that is a success story. 75,000 Pakistanis have gotten jobs. 28,000 Pakistani students are studying in China. There is greater connectivity. Uh, Gawada port is uh, moving forward with the Gawada Special Economic Zone. There was uh, Thar coal uh, in Pakistan, which was never mined. Now it is being mined. It, the mining is also being done and generating electricity. And then after that, we also have seen that uh, after the generation of electricity, the electricity is going into the national grid. So given this context, we see that the second phase of CPEC which is about industrial zones, special economic zones, which is about IT, which is about agriculture, which is about education. That is taking forward. And we feel that together, Pakistan and China will take it forward. But as I mentioned earlier, the core is the people to people connectivity. And uh, my institution, the Pakistan China Institute, which I established in 2009, is actually a labor of love to be a people's platform to bring the Chinese youth, women, civil society organizations, academia, media, uh, business persons, opinion leaders together on a similar platform so we can cooperate, we can discuss each other. And more so this cooperation is needed because of the change situation in Afghanistan. Afghanistan is a neighbor of China and Pakistan. There have been 42 years of conflict due to foreign intervention in Afghanistan. And we feel with the end of the foreign intervention, the time has come that Afghanistan take its place in the Committee of Nations. 
As a neighbor, we wish Afghanistan well. China and Pakistan were the first to give humanitarian supplies to Afghanistan. And we also would like to ensure that a humanitarian disaster is averted in Afghanistan because the people of Afghanistan, out of 35 million, 22 are food insecure. 5 million children are suffering of malnutrition. And with the coming winter months, uh, we could have a serious catastrophe. So we feel that it's important that the international community engage with the neighbors of Afghanistan, like Pakistan and China and other neighbors, so that we avert the worst case scenario. Those who are trying to impose sanctions or penalize Afghanistan are penalizing and punishing the people of Afghanistan. This is a tried, tested, and failed formula. Sanctions against Pakistan, sanctions against China, sanctions against Afghanistan. We reject that approach because it is part of an outdated Cold War mentality. So let us work together and build a better Asia, a better and a peaceful region based on cooperation, not confrontation. And hence, Pakistan-China cooperation, which is more vital in the present times, is pivotal to ensuring peace, security, and stability in our region, in Asia, and the world. Thank you very much, and I wish the conference a great success. Long live Pakistan-China friendship. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was Senator Mushahid, and he gave us uh, a, an overview of where the relationship stands, the significance of China and Pakistan, how 70 years mark the beginning of an era where uh, deepened cooperation is really the need of the hour. And also he touched upon regional developments that require us to work together more proactively. So we thank him for his uh, remarks, uh, for his special address. Up next, we will be hearing from Ambassador Moin al Haq, who is currently the serving ambassador of Pakistan to China. And he has served in the Foreign Service of Pakistan since 1987. And previously, he was also posted in, uh, in France. Uh, let's hear his comments for our webinar. So we are uh, President of CCG, Senator Mushahid Hussain, Ambassador Riaz Koker, dis dis distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, Ni hao and good morning. Let me first of all thank the organizers, Center for China and Globalization and Understanding Chinese China Forum, UCM, for inviting me to speak at this forum. It is both a pleasure and a privilege to be addressing this August gathering of eminent luminaries. Ladies and gentlemen, in Asia and beyond, President Xi Jinping's Belt and Road Initiative is a win-win proposition aimed at shared prosperity for all. Pakistan sees BRI as an initiative of generational impact, which will shape the course of the 21st century. It promotes mutually beneficial cooperation, focus on improving infrastructure connectivity build stronger momentum for common development and forge even closer partnerships. China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, the flagship project of BRI, is a game changer for Pakistan and the wider region. It is a package of several projects related to infrastructure development, power generation, fiber optic connectivity, railways, airports, ports, and industrialization. Fully aligned with the national agenda of Pakistan, CPAC is the key to our economic development and is an excellent example of an open, coordinated, and inclusive development paradigm that benefits all stakeholders. We have already began, begun to reaping dividends of CPAC energy and infrastructure projects, CPAC investment, and its Spin-off effects have generated thousands of jobs, uh, improved the li livelihoods of our people, and, and upgraded infrastructure in underdeveloped regions of Pakistan. CPAC has achieved important early harvest projects and has entered into its second phase, which is even more promising as it 
broadens the scope of cooperation and focuses on socio-economic development, agricultural cooperation, and industrialization. Special economic zones uh, being developed uh, along the route of CPEC will rejuvenate Pakistan's process of industrialization and further spur economic development. Ladies and gentlemen, substantive progress on all dimensions of CPEC reflects the immense hard work, devotion, and commitment from both sides. It is due to this resolute commitment that even during the COVID-19 pandemic, CPAC cooperation and work on all projects continued unhindered. The 10th meeting of JCC was recently held, uh, which reviewed the progress uh, uh, in different areas under CPAC and I also identified new areas of cooperation. Uh, we were able to establish a new working group uh, on IT cooperation. So we are confident that bilateral cooperation under CPAC framework would be further strengthened in the future under the leadership of President Xi and Prime Minister Imran Khan. Ladies and gentlemen, under the leadership of Prime Minister Imran Khan, Pakistan has transferred, transformed its policy from geopolitics to geoeconomics. And we endeavor to promote trade, transit, and energy flows, as well as people-to-people -people exchanges between Central Asia, South Asia, beyond the Middle East, and of course, China. This year, Pakistan and China are celebrating 70th anniversary of development of their diplomatic relations. Over the past seven decades, our bilateral relations have gone from strength to strength and reached a pinnacle that finds few parallels in the modern history of interstate relations. Our relationship today has become an all weather strategic cooperative partnership. In order to further consolidate our own week efforts for deepening our bilateral friendship, I would like to propose following ideas as a way forward. Number one, the two countries should maintain uh, momentum of high level exchanges, uh, which have been a hallmark of our bilateral ties. Uh, the, these exchanges would further enrich our all weather friendship and also set the trajectory for our future uh, course, uh, for future ties. Number two, the two countries should maintain communication and coordination at all tiers as in the past. First, with uncertainties in global political landscape and new challenges, we should further enhance our strategic coordination to safeguard our common interests. Number three, our region today is experiencing profound uh, transformation, especially after the exit of US from Afghanistan. Therefore, our two countries need to maintain close cooperation and support collective efforts for regional peace and stability, which is prerequisite for the success of BRI and CPAC. In this respect, our ongoing efforts uh, relating to this uh, six country, neighboring countries of Afghanistan mechanism is a, is a recent and very good example of regional cooperation. Number four, economic and trade types have emerged as a prominent feature of uh, bilateral relations after the, after the start of CPEC and also the finalization of the second phase of free trade agreement launched last year. And this is uh, evidenced by the fact that China has now become Pakistan's largest trading partner and uh, a bilateral tie, despite the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, has, has uh, shown a remarkable increase with the very healthy figures, especially for the exports of Pakistan to China as well. So therefore, I would suggest that our country should further deepen trade and economic linkages and also uh, integrate into ASEAN, RCEP, and SEO blocks. Number five, 
high quality development of CPEC enjoys strong support of our leadership. So it is important to expedite completion of all ongoing projects, fast paced development of SEZs and go other port. On its part, Pakistan would continue to incentivize Chinese investments to Pakistan in SCCs and other CPAC projects. And finally, uh, this year, our two countries have uh, celebrating uh, 70 years of our diplomatic ties, and we have organized many celebratory activities with main focus on cultural cooperation, people to people exchanges, and sister cities provinces relationship. This is important. Uh, because we should uh, continue not only to bring our two peoples together, but also to pass on the finest traditions of our bilateral friendship to younger generations of our two countries. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm confident that our bilateral cooperation will be further strengthened in future, and we will continue to work together to build a closer Pakistan-China community of shared future. I thank you all. Long live China Pakistan French. Mr. Wong. Thank you so much. That was Ambassador Moinul Haq. And indeed, uh, long live China Pakistan friendship, especially the part about uh, friendship between people and how the next generation we, we should uh, find ways, better ways to make sure that this bond continues and in fact uh, becomes even increasingly deeper. So that's very close to uh, the CCG mission as well, which is to connect China and the world. Uh, connect deeper bonds between people because that is at the heart of all corporations. So thank you, Ambassador, for sharing uh, uh, updates, progress, uh, successes, and also uh, suggestions for the way forward. Now let's invite Ambassador Riaz Koker. Ambassador Riaz Koker is uh, the Foreign Secretary, former Foreign Secretary of Pakistan. He served in this position from 2002 to 2005 and previously has also served as Pakistan's ambassador to India, United States, and China. Uh, he will give now a special address and help us understand more about the relationship and the region. Ambassador Riaz Koper, welcome. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Um, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Wang for his gracious invitation. Um, and uh, I also would like to extend my warmest greetings to all my friends and colleagues. Uh, I, I have, I left China a long time ago, uh, but uh, my, my personal feelings and warmth about my, uh, uh, by my stay in China uh, really are very, very strong. Um, I would not like to repeat what my uh, two distinguished speakers have already said about Pakistan-China relations. Um, Ambassador, uh, Senator Mushayda Sen gave a very comprehensive picture and so did my good friend, uh, Ambassador Moinul Haq. So I, 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 you know, I'm going to discard all that and focus on what I think are critical issues uh, facing uh, our part of the world. Um, you know, in my humble opinion, geopolitics and geoeconomics uh, have a symbiotic relationship. They, it, they cannot be divorced. Um, so what we need to see also is what is the global situation at the moment? Uh, there is disorder. Uh, the the uh, international order is in a flux. And uh, sadly, uh, the, the global situation is getting more complex. Uh, I, I think uh, this is something that we need to know before we start discussing uh, geopolitical um, sort of uh, settings of our, our relationship as well as what's happening in the regions. Um, clearly, uh, there is wide consensus that uh, the 21st century is a nation century and clearly China will be playing one of the most vital, pivotal roles in, uh, in the context of uh, what is happening in Eurasia and the a Asia Pacific. I don't like this phrase Indo-Pacific. I think it's nonsensical. Um, it's basically Asia Pacific is good enough. Uh, and uh, I, I think we, we, we need to certainly 
Pakistan and perhaps China should use this phrase rather than Indo-Pacific. Now, as I said, the uh, situation is getting very complex, uh, and, but clearly, but clearly, the uh, the relationship that is going to be with, that will define the 21st century is going to be China and the United States, uh, and uh, we certainly hope. Uh, that uh, conflict and confrontation is avoided, competition, as uh, I think somebody said, maybe stiff competition uh, is, is welcome. And I think uh, President Xi is absolutely right that the, the future development between China and the United should, States should be on the basis of, of healthy competition uh, on principles, and uh, peaceful coexistence. Uh, competition is welcome. And I think this is a very good move that President Xi himself has said that the United States is most welcome to join any uh, uh, aspects of, uh, of BRI. Now that's the, that's the global context that I wanted to give. The regional context is also very complicated. Uh, uh, you know, Pakistan is at the crossroad of uh, Central Asia, and South Asia, and West Asia, uh, and uh, clearly we we are, we provide a very very pivotal link uh, for CPAC and for BRI. Uh, when uh, BRI was was conceived, uh, I, I certainly recall uh, that well, Pakistan was one of the first countries to to welcome and support the BRI. And I personally think uh, the, uh, the initiative taken by uh, the President Xi uh, uh, was a brilliant uh, geopolitical and geoeconomic uh, project. Uh, and it's, it's amazing. I, I think uh, one should give him great credit for, for visualizing how the globe is going to be. The globe is a very small, we are all interconnected. The idea is to see how we can uh, we can we can work together in cooperation uh, and in good and in healthy competition and avoiding conflict and confrontation. I think this is the central theme of the whole thing, and I think the idea is basically to promote globalization, trade, economy, economic cooperation, uh, and also culture. Uh, I mean, China is a great. It's not only a country; so it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a it's a it's a self-contained civilization, uh, which has existed for thousands of years. So China can share its long-term experience uh, with uh, with uh, with the rest of the world. Now, I, I, I sorry, I slightly shifted. I want to go back to the region that is South Asia. We we have some serious issues here. Um, first of all, um, the United States, of course has withdrawn, the, the withdrawal of the United, the United States was very messy. Uh, and, and I think they are at the moment going through a kind of a blue period of shock and awe. Um, I think the US uh, will take some time to recover from this thing. But, but unfortunately, the attitude that the United States and West, one of the Western countries have taken towards Afghanistan is very, unfortunately, very negative. And uh, they, 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 their purpose seems to be to strangulate the new government in, uh, in, in Afghanistan. I don't think we should only refer to it as a Taliban government. It's an Afghan government. I think we, we, we ought to be very clear about the language we use when we are referring to Afghanistan. So it's, it's a pity that uh, the Western countries have taken the view uh, of non-cooperation of, uh, of uh, strangulating the country economically. Uh, unfortunately, the situation is very grim. We need, I think we, 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 should not, we should not sweep things under the carpet. We should, we should look at the reality. The situation in Afghanistan is very complex. It's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's um, uh, facing very serious economic difficulties. Uh, it's facing very serious, uh, problems relating to uh, settling down. And above all, uh, the, the country is faced with a, with a very serious humanitarian situation, a crisis, which is, which is going to have its own 
serious ripple effect uh, on countries in the region. Uh, the flow of, for instance, if, uh, if, if this, the health situation or starvation or uh, the food shortages get worse, it could get into a situation where there will be riots in Afghanistan. And at the same time, uh, the, it will create problems for the neighboring countries. So Pakistan and China have always cooperated in bringing about a certain level of, uh, shall we say, cooperation in, in, in stabilizing Afghanistan. And I think the two countries have done, very wisely done, uh, in sending humanitarian assistance. Now, I don't want to leave Afghanistan and come to South Asia, which which also is a very complicated situation. What we have at the moment in South Asia is, um, uh, shall we say, um, uh, uneasy peace. We've got a ceasefire with, with India on the line of control, but it's very fragile, very complicated. And you know, people must remember that India and Pakistan are both nuclear countries, uh, nuclear power countries. And, uh, you know, quite frankly, uh, the smallest thing can spark a Pareri fire. So I think we need to keep that factor in mind. We hope that uh, that uh, common sense uh, will prevail on both sides to ensure that there is a certain level of stability and peace and cooperation in the region. At the moment, the only regional organization that we had is SARC. And SARC, unfortunately, is again being, uh, shall be strangulated or uh, by, by, by India, I mean, we have not had a, sum, we have not had a summit in the last uh, four or five years, uh, and that is mainly because of India's opposition. Now, you see, uh, we have to keep this in mind that Pakistan and India have a complicated relationship. China has had some complications with the, with the, with the Indians as well uh, in regard to uh, the, the situation on this China-India China, uh, India border. So, so, so this is the geopolitical context. Now coming down to um, uh, uh, CPAC, uh, my good friends have already outlined, I don't want to go into the, the quality of uh, the, the question of, of projects and the details and so on and so forth, but I would like to underline two or three points. Number one, for Pakistan, this is a massive project, and we warmly welcome it. Uh, and, 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 you know, people must understand that, uh, that Gwadar port was not imposed by China. On, but we requested China for the Gwadar port. I am the one who negotiated it. So I can tell you that we are very grateful to the Chinese leadership for the very uh, generous uh, uh, help in, 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 in setting up the Gwadar project. Now, you know, for Pakistan, Pakistan is, is relatively small. We don't have that kind of expertise to handle these kind of projects. So we face some problems. There's no doubt about it. There were hiccups. Uh, and uh, I think our, our friendship, which is based on trust and confidence, uh, has, uh, has uh, been trouble-free. I think minor hiccups that happen uh, should be uh, taken with a certain degree of patience and, uh, and uh, understanding. Uh, we realized that there were some security issues. Uh, uh, we are very, very sorry that a number of Chinese uh, lost their lives. Uh, we, we extend our sympathy to the families. Then, of course, there, there, are some, there were some administrative is issues uh, that needed to be addressed. And I think Ms. Ambas uh, Senator Mushayad Hussain has already referred to the reorganization that has taken place in creating um, uh, um, uh, the uh, sort of CPEC authority, as well as um, the reorganization of the Board of Investment. So I think the government of Pakistan, the people of Pakistan are deeply, deeply committed to seeing CPAC flower as it has been envisaged by the leaderships on, on, on both sides. And I also want to want, make one more point. We cannot forget that the Pakistan-China relationship is foundational and it's foundational because the, the greatest leaders of China 
and the greatest leaders in Pakistan contributed brick by brick in building this edifice of, of, a, of an excellent relationship. Now, let me be frank here. There, there, are, there are forces that are working against some of these brilliant schemes, uh, like, for instance, uh, CPEC. Uh, I will be very straightforward in stating that, 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 that we, there is some level of opposition from India, for instance. Uh, India sees uh, CPEC uh, as, as something which is uh, uh, undermining its uh, uh, security or undermining its interests. And I think to a very large extent, they've also convinced the Americans that uh, CPEC is a, is, is a project that has, uh, that has uh, implications, security implications for Pakistan, uh, for, 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 for India and for the West. Now, it is the responsibility of Pakistan, also the responsibility of China, a great friend of Pakistan, that we, we address these misperceptions. I mean, you know, it's, it's misperceptions which are propaganda based. So I think there is a, a certain level of responsibility on the part of China and Pakistan to address these issues. Likewise, on the question of BRI, which is a brilliant project, transcontinental, over the next three uh, three decades or so, till two, 2049, uh, a network of roads, network of uh, uh, of roads, uh, motorways, railroads, uh, sea lanes. Uh, uh, how 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 this is going to work together is and in a way, BRI and CPEC get connected at a very at a, at a very strategic area, which gives a. Uh, um, uh, us access to to West Asia, to Central Asia, to to the Arab world, to Africa, and also to Europe. So I think we we uh, as as friends, as partners, we need to uh, shall we say um, uh, address some of the concerns that uh, we we find with uh, with uh, with some of the countries that are in opposition to some of these projects. Now, finally, uh, I would say that uh, um, uh, it's a brilliant project. Uh, we fully support it. We see the advantages of, uh, of uh, how trade and commerce and economic cooperation, uh, globalization, all these things will flower. At the same time, uh, I think both Pakistan and China are deeply committed to multilateralism. We fully believe in the Charter of the United Nations. We fully believe we cooperate on huge number of international issues. Uh, we have common views. Uh, we consult each other, and we we are not we are not partners against anybody. I think this is a point I want to underline. We are friends, and we welcome cooperation and help uh, and assistance uh, on the basis of principles from uh, other countries. Uh, finally, uh, I would say that uh, it was very heartening that the, that the, uh, the meeting between, uh, you know, the virtual meeting between President Xi and President Biden uh, gives us hope uh, uh, that they do realize that the future of the globe rests very much on the cooperation uh, <clears throat> And, and, and coexistence between China and the, and, and the United States. It has global implications. So I think this is the first meeting. It has uh, <clears throat> created some hope and we hope subsequent meetings are also in this, held in the same spirit. Uh, last uh, two sentences, um, uh, we uh, we owe it to the great leaders of China and great leaders of Pakistan that we maintain this long-standing friendship on the basis of trust, uh, mutual benefit, uh, mutual respect. And I see a very bright future for Pakistan-China relationship. Uh, so I would like to uh, conclude by thanking uh, the government and the people of China for all that you have done for us over the last 
70 years and you've done so much that uh, I think words are not enough to express our gratitude. Thank you very much. I have, uh, thank you so much, Ambassador Ras Coker, really uh, from explaining the geopolitical uh, situation uh, coming towards the region and bilateral relationship. I think what's especially important, uh, and that is the important context for our meeting as well, is CPEC, BRI are inclusive. The idea is about coexistence, about uh, finding ways uh, to help people. Why not? I mean, we talk about expanding, uh, taking CPEC and uh, allowing CPEC to benefit people, Afghanistan and beyond, and why not towards South Asia as well? That could be a, an, a great opportunity for people, and that's really at the heart of the cooperation. And indeed, the, the feeling on both sides is mutual. Uh, brick by brick, like also Dr. Wang mentioned, it's, it's a relationship that has been built over years of cooperation and uh, care for each other. So with that, uh, we have uh, had three special addresses uh, for today's webinar. And now we move on to, uh, to the next part of our webinar, which is really understanding the bilateral and also some, uh, some key, uh, key dimensions of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. Uh, we've divided this into two parts, which is firstly CPEC, understanding CPEC and the way forward for CPEC. Uh, and the second part will focus more on the region. And uh, for the first part, uh, it's, uh, it's our immense honor to have with us Ambassador Masood Khalid, who has uh, served as ambassador of Pakistan to China for uh, almost six years from 2013, when CPEC was conceived really uh, towards when, uh, when uh, the scope of CPEC had also further been enhanced. So uh, Ambassador Masood Khalid, you have been a mentor to me and so many people, you have really uh, seen how CPEC shaped and how it was envisioned and also executed in the first uh, critical and very decisive stages. Um, we, we welcome you to share your ideas uh, on the CPEC's vision and also what is the CPEC promise and way forward. Thank you. Uh, so you are uh, muted. Thank you. Sorry. Good morning and good afternoon uh, to my Chinese friends and thank you very much uh, Zoom for your kind introduction. And uh, I'm grateful to President Wang of uh, the center for inviting me. And uh, it, it's a real pleasure to see all of you, uh, despite you know, these uh, travel barriers we, we are facing right now. So good to see you. Now, <clears throat> the two uh, distinguished speakers, Senator Mushahid Hussain and Ambassador Riaz Koker, uh, for whom I have great personal respect have given a very comprehensive, uh, you know, uh, geopolitical picture of uh, of uh, uh, the the, uh, the the problems and the challenges uh, faced by BRI, challenges faced by the region and by our global community. Uh, so I think they have set the ball rolling for this webinar, and I hope that in the course of our discussion, there will be questions uh, to sort of you know amplify what they stated and amplify our thoughts. But I'll try to restrict myself uh, to the theme you have assigned me and which is CPAC. And then of course, I will, don't hold me at fault if I also drag in the direction of geopolitics and geoeconomics, because as, as you know, um, professionals and practitioners of diplomacy, uh, that is a handicap uh, we, we suffer from. And I also uh, wish to acknowledge here uh, the, the points made by um, His Excellency Ambassador Muin al uh, when he when he talked of the way forward and he uh, raised some important points, you know, as to how this CPAC and how this relationship between Pakistan and China can be, uh, you know, uh, can, can further move forward. So let's talk about the CPAC first. In my view, since its launch in 2013, in fact, the real work started in late 2014 and 15 when President Xi Jinping visited Pakistan. I think CPEC has made steady progress overall, despite the hiccups. You know, hiccups uh, when, I mean, there was a change of, uh, of government in Pakistan. So it was natural for the new government, to, you know, to sort of, review and assess as to what CPAC in, entailed. And then we, we, we uh, were, uh, you know, uh, confronted with this pandemic, which continues to 
create havoc in our social uh, lives. <clears throat> and besides that, there were disruptions uh, in, in supply chains and logistics, which also created problems in, in the seamless implementation of, of CPAC for, for, for a year or so. But some early harvest projects have been completed. We are all aware that energy sector has made good progress and is still right now even uh, some mega projects in power sector are being implemented with Chinese help. Now the, uh, the, transport, uh, the transport and the infrastructure projects have also uh, made good progress uh, with this Multan Sakhar Highway, Karakram upgradation and various other projects, road projects all across Pakistan and they are picking up momentum. Similarly, Gawadar is also showing a good progress now. There was some kind of slowdown, but I think uh, I think uh, subsequent speakers will uh, highlight uh, more because they are the experts. Uh, we are getting Mr. Jang Baojong also, and you know the output sub also. So I think they will highlight these aspects in greater detail. But I think Gawadar port and satellite infrastructure is also uh, picking up now pace. Now, as far as special economic zones are concerned, I think uh, they have lagged behind, uh, but I understand that they are also now receiving priority of the government. And in my view, I think their successful completion is the litmus test for CPAC, for the success of CPAC, because uh, once they are successful, they are fully operational, they will ensure uh, industrialization of Pakistan, you know, uh, expansion of our export base and, and the broader vision of uh, connectivity and regional integration. So I think uh, SEZs are very, very important. And of course, Pakistan will have to, uh, Pakistan is trying, but it will have to ensure that there is an enabling environment and preferential policies uh, for, for the Chinese companies, as well as other foreign uh, investors who wish to come in and, and you know, invest in uh, economic zones. Now, $25 billion worth of investment has already been injected into Pakistan's economy, despite problems and despite hiccups. So this is uh, quite an achievement. And of course, local job creation. Second phase, uh, we have completed the early uh, harvest projects. Now we are entering into second phase and uh, it's a scope and size has been broadened. And it has also been agreed upon that uh, Pakistan and China will undertake, uh, you know, uh, projects in Afghanistan. And I think some work is uh, going on in that direction. Uh, later on, depending on the progress, CPAC will be extended to the wider region of Central Asia. So this is the vision on which work is uh, going on. Uh, and as President Wang said, I, and I noted in his remarks that he said that CPAC can be an enabler for regional connectivity and, you know, regional economic <clears throat> cooperation. Now, China's BRI, of which CPAC is a pioneering project, offers a ray of hope and a new paradigm of peace and development uh, in an uncertain and turbulent world. And BRI's vision of shared prosperity is surely a better recipe than the unilateralism and zero-sum uh, mindset uh, which we see uh, you know, these days. In our globalized and interdependent world, no single country is in a position to, uh, howsoever powerful, it is in a position to tackle with multi-dimensional challenges uh, which the global community faces and BRI offers an opportunity for coexistence and cooperation. CPAC, in my view, serves the long-term interest of China and Pakistan, which have been strategic partners for the last 70 years. Both remain committed to its development and Pakistan's role is critical in BRI and, and the CPAC. Uh, the CPAC there are critics and skeptics, so I want to respond to them that CPAC has helped and well helped Pakistan in meeting its development and infrastructure deficit. This is very important. And as Ambassador Koka just said, this is the first 
mega investment package of its kind ever offered by a foreign government to Pakistan in its history. So you can see its significance and its magnitude. Uh, this, of course, reflects our time-tested uh, time tested friendship, as well as China's confidence in Pakistan's economic potential. So for Pakistan, it's a rare window of opportunity to develop its economy, broaden its technological and industrial base, and most importantly, in my view, to enhance its human resource capacity. Pakistan's unique geography, its proximity to resource-rich Afghanistan and Central Asia offers those countries, these countries, sorry, to look to the ports of Gwadar and Karachi for their trade. And already some, some beginning has been made. So the potential is enormous for the Chinese companies to come and explore this untapped potential, which is very much there. The next phase I, I mentioned, you know, offers cooperation in science and technology, industry, agriculture, tourism in the context of Gandhara culture, very important. And I think it can transform, help transform Pakistan's economy uh, in, in my view, in less than four to five years, uh, you know, if, if we are focused and targeted. And it can also help Pakistan break its vicious poverty cycle and you know um, and and realize the dream this geoeconomics uh, connectivity etc uh, but at the same time as uh, senator mushahed and ambassador crooker mentioned uh, cpac and bri face geopolitical headwinds uh, the recent developments in afghanistan have of course injected uncertainty and new power rivalry in the region and U.S. strategy to contain China and contain China's rise is also manifest in South Asia with this alignment of policies between the United States and, and India. And this, this, this is in full play now in South Asia. Powerful lobbies are working to misrepresent and discredit CPAC. False narratives are being built to sow mistrust in Pakistan-China relations. In my view, better lines have already been drawn and they are there to contain china's rise to scuttle and impede the progress of bri and by consequence cpac i also hold the view that in the ultimate analysis these attempts will not succeed as countries joining bri know and realize the benefits this mega project offers pakistan and china have maintained uh, a trustworthy relationship for the last 70 years. And in the given uncertainty and complexity of the situation, Pakistan and China need to work more closely to defeat the designs of our adversaries. There should be no compromise on CPAC and both countries should bilaterally address any bottlenecks which may be hindering its smooth implementation and a proactive approach is needed. Uh, on its part, I feel that there is a need to uh, counter this propaganda. And China needs to also accelerate its public diplomacy to sensitize the world that China's BRI is meant to help the developing and poor countries in the context of South-South cooperation. Uh, we are also, you know, talking of these developed countries uh, offering uh, loan uh, you know, uh, reprieve uh, to, to poor and developing countries in the wake of uh, COVID pandemic. I think that any reprieve which China can uh, offer uh, in loan recovery to poor and developing countries at this stage will greatly help dampen the negative propaganda about China and about BRI. Uh, this is one of the thoughts I had. We in Pakistan see China as a voice of restraint and reason in international affairs. And its approach of, its approach of cooperation and coexistence as opposed to confrontation and conflict is fully supported by Pakistan. And I think uh, 
Yeah, that is very important uh, that we keep in mind that we'll, both our countries will continue to face challenges, will continue to face impediments, will continue to see these false narratives uh, to create misgivings, uh, but we should not uh, let ourselves be deterred by, 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 by these machinations and, and continue uh, our journey of friendship and remain on course. This is very, very important uh, because you know China is a big country. China has uh, important commitments, important priorities in its foreign policy. But in the region, uh, China-Pakistan friendship, you know, uh, represents a beacon of light and a beacon of hope for so many countries and in a model, in fact, in interstate relationships. And as Ambassador Riaz Koka said, that it is very important that our leaders have invested in this relationship and it's a foundational relationship and we should not uh, let that be uh, lost sight of. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I, I very much welcome this interaction and this forum, this platform the center has provided. More such bonding, more such connectivity through people-to-people -people exchanges, scholarly exchanges and intellectual interaction is uh, very much required. And I hope you will continue to make uh, your endeavors in this regard. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Those really, um, I think, uh, I, I, I especially loved your starting by, um, it's really impossible to isolate uh, CPEC from regional realities because it is a vision that encompasses uh, broader connectivity. And of course, the suggestions you have, uh, we also have today, for instance, we have uh, Mustafa from Pakistan China Institute who will talk about uh, think tank cooperation as well. We have the CPEC Media Forum, another, uh, another great initiative to continue the dialogue. And um, we at CCG also believe in dialogue. Uh, that is what we're having now. So uh, dialogue, mutual understanding, friendship, that is uh, going to uh, enable better cooperation. Thank you for all of your suggestions. Now we may take a small detour. Uh, we have with us uh, Mr. Imtiaz Gul. Basically, the first panel is about uh, more um, China-Pakistan economic corridor. And on the second panel, we, uh, we plan to engage uh, regional and uh, international relations, uh, geopolitical uh, topics. But Mr. Imtiaz Gul, are you, uh, are you available right now? He, uh, he may... Yeah, can you hear me? Can you we hear me? I can't see you. Uh... I would rather stay off screen, off screen, uh, if possible, uh, because I'm traveling, uh, so I can I can speak. Uh, okay, uh, if you can make remarks for like maybe a few minutes, uh, four to five, five to six minutes maximum, that would be great. And uh, I... uh, let me quickly introduce you as well. Uh, that mm -hmm. would be uh, so, Mr. Imtiaz Bolling, Executive Director of Center for Research and Security Studies. Uh, which he founded in 2007. He is also a well-published author, and he is today going to briefly discuss uh, Pakistan's policy, uh, foreign policy perspective, and the region. Excuse my throat. Um, uh, Mr. Mr. Gould, thank you for participating. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay, first of all, uh, uh, apologies uh, for joining late. Uh, I just got the timing wrong. Uh, uh, the, this three-hour difference sometimes, you know, upsets. Uh, our calculations and planning. Uh, secondly, uh, thank you very much for uh, allowing me to speak a little ahead of uh, my slot. Uh, very kind of you. And I hope uh, other participants uh, don't mind it. Uh, keeping in view my particular situation right now. Um, and thirdly, yes, uh, I'm a published author. Very recently, I published uh, the book on Pakistan-China relations, uh, launched about six weeks ago. And the title is What Lies Behind the Iron Brotherhood, in which I try to explain the foundational nature, as Riaz Kokar Saab uh, just said, of the relationship which basically uh, moves forward independent of what happens in other parts of the world, what happens between Pakistan, uh, US or China, China, US. So this is a very unique uh, relationship. And I think uh, since uh, uh, you can't see me, I, will, I, I can try to be actually very brief. Uh, the, Pakistan, the foreign policy uh, landscape right now, I think, dictates 
that both countries stick together as much as they have so far, particularly on Afghanistan. And we have seen a great synergy of thought and action for the past uh, two years, Mr. Wang Yi, uh, the Chinese foreign minister, and his deputies have been in very regular contact with uh, the Pakistani counterparts, and they've also been in contact with the Doha-based uh, Taliban leadership. So that is what is required, that, that independent of what uh, the United States uh, and other uh, its uh, Western allies do on Afghanistan, we have to stick together and work towards the stabilization uh, of Afghanistan. Uh, that is the key, I think, to uh, not only to the Belt and Road Initiatives, westward expansion, but also uh, very, very critical for the success of uh, the China-Pakistan economic corridor. Uh, and for that, I think I would say that uh, uh, as, as a way forward on the foreign policy synergy, uh, we, both countries, the leadership, have to be very candid and straight to each other. We must discuss reservations, doubts, if there, if any, uh, openly, rather than trying to find answers uh, through intermediaries. Uh, also, secondly, don't let uh, the foreign policy positions vis-a-vis -vis other countries obstruct the smooth passage and taking forward of uh, uh, bilateral relations. And uh, also, I think... Uh, uh, the uh, there's since there are a lot of pro projects right now on the CPAC, uh, and there was a, a very recent instance, and in, uh, there was a news. I don't know. I couldn't verify that that five or six Baloch workers were instantly fired by a Chinese company in Gawada, uh, and there was no real uh, follow up or explanation. So I would say that uh, in the first place, uh, avoid knee jerk reactions to certain situations. The way the Chinese officials reacted uh, to the Dasu terrorist attack uh, because that reaction gave a lot of spice to, to outsiders, to all those who want to undermine the steady progress of uh, CPEC. And we also have to instantly provide explanations uh, to situations such as the one that prevailed in Gwada or in other part of Baluchistan when Uh, Ms. Imtaz, I think, um, um, is Ms. Imtaz, to, to, yes, we are connected now. Yeah, yes. so as yes. part of, a, as part of a, uh, effective strategic communication, we must always be uh, very, very prompt in providing explanations to certain situations, and that would avoid, I think, uh, misunderstandings, as well as uh, prevent any abuse, any uh, exploitation by the opponents, by the enemies of the CPAC and China and Pakistan uh, to, to portray a CPAC in, in negative light. So I think I'll stop there. There's a lot. Thank I think you. other friends would also like to speak, speak on these issues. But the way forward is stick together, coordinate policies, avoid knee-jerk reactions, and provide instant explanations to whatever actions we are taking. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Imtaz Kul. Uh, that really, I mean, I think that message was concise and very effective. Um, how can we, we all are aware that there are certain forces, certain stakeholders that may want to see uh, maybe disturbances. Uh, and uh, sometimes media or platforms have not the best incentives. So let's try not to let uh, some issues that are still not fully understood sensationalize and cause misinformation. So thank you. That was uh, that was a great uh, brief and very important comment by Mr. Imtiaz Gul, a known uh, expert. And towards the end of today's panel uh, discussions, we will we will understand more about this particular dimension, which is integral uh, to the way forward. And now we will. Uh, uh, Chairman Zhang Baojong of COPHC. Uh, he, he, he is hosting a delegation of senators, uh, which is why he's not with us, but he sent a very short video telling us the progress in Gwadar so far. So that ties in very well with uh, Gwadar, which has been mentioned a few times. And right after that, we will understand special economic zones with Mr. Hassan Daudbad. So let's watch a brief video by Chairman Zhang Baojong of uh, China Overseas Sports Holding Company. Honorable Senator and Brother Mr. Sheet. Honorable Senator Lias Huck, Honorable Senator Muid Yusuf, dear leaders, professors, ladies and gentlemen, 
It is such a great honor for me and a pleasure for me to participate this important webinar. Special thanks to Drew Muhammad, a young lady who is always energetic to promote Pakistan-China friendship. I'm so lucky that I have experienced the whole process of Chinese globalization from passive to active. I wish through the process of water development, people may understand how Chinese are integrated with locals to materialize the dream of building up a human community with shared future. The Guadal Free Zone Phase 1 is already completed, and the facility of Guadal Free Zone Phase 1 is as good as any other free zone in the world, with the facility of a narrow interrupted power supply, water supply, telecommunication, uh, drainage system, office, etc. More than 36 investors already registered with Water Free Zone, and among these investors, 60% uh, are from China, and 40% are our local brothers and sisters. We are looking forward more Pakistani businessmen uh, join the development and the Guadar Free Zone. New Guadar International Airport, definitely it is one of the most important projects for CPAC and for all the Pakistan. It is in line with the vision of Honorable Prime Minister for promote the tourism industry in Pakistan. And this new international airport of the completion will play important roles in the development of Gwadar. You know that uh, this airport has the longest runway uh, in this region, and uh, even the biggest aircraft, the Boeing 380, could be landed in this airport, and it will bring more tourists to Gwadar. I believe now the contractors, uh, together with our Pakistani brothers and sisters, are working day and night, and it is expected that the operation could be started by end of this uh, next year. And the competition date is early in 2023. You know, master plan plays a very important roles in any city, what happens in Karachi. And because of lack of uh, plan, there are, uh, it's very congested. It's very difficult to change once the construction is already there. And we are very happy that uh, the authority uh, understand the issue. We are really grateful to the Chinese government that they approve the fund for develop a smart water city plan. And this smart water city plan is one of the best plan I have seen in the world. And I hope that uh, this master plan will be fully executed as a plan. And I do believe that if we follow this master plan, water will be developed as one of the most beautiful, convenient city in this world. At the East Bay Expressway, we'll bypass water port city and uh, minimize the disturbance. So this dedicated East Bay Expressway will make the port more efficient and less disturbance to the local brothers and sisters. The Vocational Training Institute. Now the construction is already completed. A hand hour uh, will be done by the end of this year. And this Vocational Training Institute will not only increase the employment chance for the local uh, brothers and sisters, and also uh, it will help uh, the operation of water port and the free zone. And I, as an uh, investor from China, we are facing a problem, shortage of qualified engineers and the technicians. And this vocational training institute definitely will, it will help us to remove this issue. And in addition to this vocational training institute, we have a 300 bed hospital, which is already under construction. You know that medical treatment 
is one of the issues uh, faced by our local brother and sister for the last decade. And I do believe this modern 300 bed hospital will resolve the issues of medical treat treatment. This is a, a cultivation uh, greenhouse, and uh, we have a tissue plant laboratory over there. And from the tissue laboratory, we use the most advanced technology to clonize different uh, variety of uh, plant. And uh, our target is that uh, to make our local brothers benefit from such kind of uh, research. And uh, we will give the sampling to our local brothers so that they can plant it in their own land, in their own home, and uh, put, uh, plant more trees and the flowers. This will not only help to improve the environmental issue, but also our local brothers will get some eco immediate economic returns. Asla e jo established with a factory ama timber to purpose ami bita ke eda jo asse mardi adam birozgar hai lekin jani adam ham asse na khaskar ama jani adam ke kam taali me aafte hain ya gair taali me aafte hain logon to kanishta ka to ab ki income generate karne ki wasa in cheeze ka nak roti aur badre mardom bas talented hain jani adam che ke chishi kar zan ama shala che ke institute ba sa sikta ke toke hain kan ke toke hain और हम अमी लोटी के माँ लोटी के आहिस्ता आहिस्ता स्टेप बाय स्टेप शेयर और अन्नी मैं सिर्फ लोकली हम दोर्ट से तहे स्टाफ आनी सिक्योरिटी यूनिफॉर्म्स हसा यानी गुद हसा गोरा कने के पति कोई भी डिजाइन मार दे इन फ्यूचर मैं लोटी के मैं ग्वादर नहीं स्कूल आने को माँ या बाकी कंपनीज आने को माँ जो ऐसे कॉन्ट्रैक्ट बिजी रहे ऑर्डर बिजी रहे और शेयर मजीद स्प्रेड भी करें थैंक यू फॉर अटेंशन आई विश I have the honor and the pleasure to receive you in Guadar at the earliest convenient time. Wish this forum a big success. Thanks and goodbye. Great Honorable time. Senator and Brother Mr. Shi. Okay, that was a small error. Thank you. I really want to really thank uh, Chairman Zhang for that video because. Um, having been to Gwadar myself, so many people here uh, have been to Gwadar, have actually planned and conceived a lot of it. A lot of the progress that we see uh, is really an example of what kind of holistic development we are trying to uh, uh, reach out for, trying to aim for under the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor and the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, without further ado, let's invite uh, Mr. Hassan Daud Bhatt, who is currently CEO of Heber Pakhtunkhwa Board of Investments and Trade. And he has also been, uh, he has really taken a, a very important role when we talk about CPEC, uh, because Mr. Hassan Daud was the former um, special envoy for CPEC. And we also met in Beijing a few times. Uh, Mr. Uh, Hassan Daud, but the floor is yours. Uh, you're muted, I believe. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we still can't hear you. I'm not sure what the technical issue is. Can other people hear Mr. Hassan Daudbat or is it? No? Okay. Okay, thank you, <laughs> Professor Chen also. Uh, uh, Mr. Hassan, I'm not sure what the, uh, uh, maybe there is, um, the mic isn't connected via Zoom. Is if Mr. Mr. Hassan, is it possible that in the meantime we hear from Mr. Wang just for five uh, um, for about five minutes on engaging businesses and untapping tourism in the meantime? So, if you allow, let's give Mr. Wang Zahai the floor and for a few minutes. Thank you, Mr. Wang Zahai. Uh, we met recently at a very important event, uh, which was about uh, promoting tourism between China and Pakistan. And uh, Mr. Wang Zahai has years of experience in Pakistan, is a known person, was leading Ching Chi, uh, which is a known brand in Pakistan. And currently, Mr. Wang Zahai is president of the Pakistan-China Joint Chamber of Commerce and Industry in Qingdao at Skoda. So, Mr. Wang, the floor is yours. Please, if we, it would be great within five minutes if we can hear uh, more about enhancing businesses and tourism between the two countries. Thank you. Yeah, so Excellencies, dear, dear friends, thanks CCG for today's brilliant conference. And I'm also very glad to see 
many new and old friends and share their recent thoughts here. So former speakers have put forward detailed and insightful views on Pakistan-China to enhance regional engagement and security and the Belt and Road vision. So I would like to focus on Pakistan and China tourism potential and the prospects. So you know, in the years before the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, Pakistan tourism industry had been developed steadily with the significant increase in the number of tourism from 1.6 million to uh, that uh, this is in 2014 and to 6.6 million in 2018. So with a total tourism increase with 317% in five years. So meanwhile, in China, tourism industry has also entered one era of the mass tourism. China has become the world's fastest growing source of outbound tourism. So within 131 million of Chinese citizens traveling abroad in 2017, and also with the year on year basis 7% uh, increase. So we can see that the Pakistan-China tourism co uh, cooperation have great potential and room for the development. So the vast land and the strong historical heritage have created countless historical and cultural landscapes in China. So does in Pakistan. So as an important member of the Belt and Road Initiative and China always a strategic partner, Pakistan is also abundant with all countless tourism resources. So I would took that uh, following the points to discuss with all your excellencies. Number one is the ice and snow plus industry integrated development. You know, this is very, the fashion we are talking the plus. So Olympic winter game is uh, be scheduled to uh, inaugurate it in Beijing on the coming February. So which will bring huge opportunities to be ice and snow sports products plus industry. So Northern Pakistan is rich in uh, ice and snow resources and also have a great potential uh, for the ice show, ice and snow sports and tourism uh, develop as ice and snow industry. The both sides, I mean, China and Pakistan can aim for the market and collaborate to strengthen the infrastructure construction of ice and snow industry. And the planned ice snow tourism project includes skating, skating, snow modeling, et cetera. So secondly, infrastructure construction for communication in Northern area. I have been to North of Pakistan a few of the times. It's marvelous the natural science, but uh, very, that frankly is short of the basic infrastructure of communication. Just now we do not have any that uh, mobile uh, signals that it, it will be far behind to that, uh, to that uh, Lego. Yeah. So this is that, uh, that uh, we, we are thinking that uh, Pakistan, China should be uh, that John hand to develop that uh, uh, infrastructure in Northern of Pakistan. And along with that, uh, also Pakistan now have that one digital Pakistan strategy is we can be working together. So number three is the Pakistan-China friendship interaction with the tourism. The friendship and uh, that uh, th this is the tourism can be interact each, each other. So in tourism development, we can consider adding more humanistic publicity elements and uh, automatically from one party in which Friendship and tourism can be promote each other. Uh, number four is culture exploration. So culture as a spiritual force can be transformed into material force into that uh, process of people's understanding and also the transformation of the world. So China and the Pakistan, so they, this can be depending though this culture that exploration. So recently, so in our center, we launched one that, uh, that uh, Pakistan culture tour exhibition in, in our center, we call the Ganara Smile. So it was held in August, which is uh, attracted a large number of that uh, visitors and also have an amazing effect. So we will plan a serious culture tour exhibition in the future. So in addition to processing a large number of the natural resources, I understand also one of the transit points of the Silk and Road. No, previously, why 
that uh, there is a lack of the security and uh, that in the northern of area of Pakistan. So this is a stop that uh, Chinese visitor to visit there. So now the situation much better in this region. We do believe that Pakistan, China and Afghanistan and also surrounding countries can be working together closely for promote that this tourism. So right now that uh, I sit in that uh, working in Pakistan China Center, which is located in Qingdao, is the ICO local economic and trade demonstration area. So we are making efforts to promote tourism exchange between Pakistan and China. So in that uh, September, so we that uh, coordinate with the uh, Qingdao Tourism uh, Association and the uh, TDCP, that's uh, Punjab, and also SDDC in Sin, they may sign the memorandum. So after that uh, pandemic, we will start closely, start to do that uh, work closely to promote uh, two-way uh, tourism between uh, each other countries. So this is uh, my today's speech. I looking forward to let us join hands for two-way tourism. This is a really good mind for both of us. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Wang Zahai. What an important uh, presentation and really tourism, like you say, culture, it can be turned into um, a, something of very tangible uh, benefit to ordinary people. Many other suggestions. Thank you so much for all your contributions and also uh, your very uh, insightful speech today. Now let's invite Mr. Hassan Daoud. Mr. Uh, Mr. Daoud, the floor is yours. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Brilliant. Excellent. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Yes. So, Bismillah rahman rahim Zao Shan Hao, Ni Hao, to all my friends uh, in, uh, in China and uh, all my mentors, leaders who are here listening to me. Uh, I, at the beginning, you know, congratulate the Center for China and Globalization and uh, also the Chinese government for, uh, for arranging this and particularly Chinese government on achieving uh, the status of Xiao Kang. Uh, 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 this year and a lot of other achievements that you made and it makes us all happy, feel proud for China. I also take this opportunity to wish you well for the forthcoming Beijing Olympics, Winter Olympics and uh, uh, sitting here in Pakistan, we will be cherishing each and every gold medal that, you, that China gets and we will learn perhaps in the next uh, Winter Olympics, Pakistan would have its representation. So ladies and gentlemen, with this said, uh, as somebody who's working on, on, uh, on CPAC at the ground level, uh, let me just first say that sometimes for people, project managers and project leaders like us, the narrative does not matter. The narrative part I will leave to my uh, seniors, my leaders who are here. For us, timely delivery of the project within the scope, within the cost is, is extremely important and attracting more investment through the through achieving targets is extremely important. And I believe that while there be a, there will be a confluence and convergence of uh, various contributory factors that we will discuss today and I'll highlight for you later. The deciding factor, ladies and gentlemen, I believe will be the number of projects we operationalize the number of people we take out of poverty and learn from the experience of China and bring the rural, urban and regional synergy that, uh, that is the, the bedrock for a Belt and Road Initiative. Ladies and gentlemen, despite sharing geographical proximity, we still live in a least integrated region. And thanks to bitter politics and poor infrastructure. Today, most part of South Asia, including Maldives, Nepal, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Sri Lanka, and Afghanistan, lack regional connectivity with inadequate infrastructure as compared to other regions. And this is besides the internet, uh, access to internet, access to electricity, access, uh, access to clean drinking water. And these are the challenges I look at when I look at CPAC, when I look at BRI, and when I look at the task that is that, that the government is uh, given to us at the operational level, because I personally believe that economic growth will, through CPAC and BRI, will also help in playing a major role in bridging the dress, trust deficit. The more projects we deliver, the more people we take out of poverty, uh, we feed more people, I think the regional integration will take shape, 
either it's with Afghanistan, with Central Asian Republic, and with, with any part where today we do not have that level of trust. Today, the region has several challenges, including pandemic, food insecurities, and poverty. And uh, notwithstanding this dynamic Asian century uh, and looking at terrorism, extremism, and separatism that is being discussed time and again, I think the beacon of hope and the beacon of light, I think as Ambassador Masood Khalid Saab has stated, I think remains Belt and Road Initiative. We look at Belt and Road Initiative as a great opportunity, at least for the generation that I represent. As long as we are on this planet, I think if BRI is, is, is placed well, we will be able to have its dividend. We will be able to uh, you know, leverage from our natural endowment that the region has. And uh, besides that, uh, I, I think uh, uh, I would also like to highlight a few facts because of working on CPAC. Like I'm in, responsible for Russia Kai. In Russia Kai, we have had Chinese investment already. A, a steel plant will be operational next year. And I think, I believe that next year will be extremely important. And I, I would have said 2021 earlier, but because of COVID, I think next year is extremely important. We will see commissioning of energy hydro projects. Karot, I, I, I'm sure you must have read all the reports. Uh, uh, Russia Kai, Dabeji would commission. Uh, Faisalabad is coming up well. Next year, Suki Kenari will also be. So all these projects and the the uh, socio-economic development projects under the Chinese grant of 1 billion would also be on ground because of COVID, the exchange of experts could not take place. Therefore, I believe the One Belt, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative of uh, uh, envisaged by President Xi Jinping is although ambitious, but the impact that is have is considerable. I, at the operation level, do not care what others think of Belt and Road as long as it is for like Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, it is connecting us to the uh, main urban centers, less developed areas of Di Khan, Zob, uh, on the Western Corridor are being connected with main urban centers of Islamabad. I can just highlight because of one highway, Di Khan connecting to, uh, to uh, Islamabad through a motorway has attracted $12 billion of investment from local investors coming from Punjab to Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. And I, this, remember, uh, this reminds me of old Chinese saying, if you want to become rich, build roads. And I think in for developing uh, infrastructure, I, I, I'm sure they must have mentioned infrastructure at that time, but it's like, it's making us become rich. It is taking us towards the right path of, uh, of uh, how it takes, but more importantly, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the connectivity of pol policy is also possible through forging strong synergy and uh, broadening extensive consultation for harmonization of policies. I still see some challenges. I still, still see some, you know, as we move into the B2B second phase, there will be challenges of addressing minor disputes between companies because it has happened, it's natural. It's not because of BRI and CPEC. When two companies, two enterprises, I always love Chao Bai Chong speaking because he, he is a reflection of how a leader working abroad on a cross-cultural project should be, embracing local culture, highlighting uh, the challenges and opportunities that, that you know, it is bringing. And I've seen this happening in, in Balochistan and how people are traveling. There will be challenges they, because the expectations are very high, ladies and gentlemen, and we need to deliver on the people's expectation together, all of us listening, sitting on this forum. So lastly, I have few uh, recommendations on if your time, if, if your time allows, I'll quickly go through them. First of all, we Beautiful need the to, idea. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah. First of all, we need to develop dynamic multi pronged approach to adapt new policy instruments and formulate structural reform in order to make space for added growth and sustainable economic momentum for a win-to-win, win-win-win principle. The more projects you deliver, the narrative, you know, I remember in 2013 when I was in China, they were talk about string of pearls, but it died down. Then came the East India Company narrative. It died down because projects are being delivered. Things are happening on ground. 
and you know you don't have to worry about naysayers because they are called naysayers because they don't want to do anything and just say negative things secondly a well coherent and intercoordinated approach should be worked out to enable win win cooperation and create a shared destiny for mankind i think on certain areas like r and d like agriculture like industrial cooperation the joint working group should meet twice a year as opposed on yearly basis they should meet more regularly there should be more interaction and people and officials in pakistan should study the reports sent by chinese and chinese counterparts should study the reports we send to them it should not be for taking few pictures and you know highlighting this in the near local media it's about studying all the uh, because it happens i'm i'm stating and i have uh, this is whatever i'm stating i'm stating right from the heart and you know because this platform provides us to seize opportunity and formulate ways for addressing the regional and local economic woes we all should make effort for broad stroke inclusive policy that strongly you know helps uh, rejuvenate some of the died areas like tourism i still remember we have in the long term plan of 2017 one plus five tourism corridor and we must work on this because five coastal stations develop will turn around the region then we have the ajk tourism silk route proposal and i'm very happy to state that in the 10th joint uh, cooperation committee meeting tourism has been included as one of the pillar for next areas uh, next uh, two years and uh, will be included in the industrial cooperation third a well coordinated policy framework acceptable and workable for all and based on the cultural uh, difference that we have should be adopted to achieve and yield optimal benefits especially in agriculture sector we are we work in a traditional way so there with people to people interaction experts coming together i think we can work together uh, fifth is to establish alternate dispute resolution mechanism to avoid delays and bottlenecks we have been saying this we have been talking about this we always say jcc is a mechanism yes on a g to g level but for a b to b we must immediately with the help of the supreme court set up an a, you know alternate dispute resolution and i think we can uh, leverage from what uh, china has done for bri in shian and lastly i think we all sitting here friends of bri friends of cpac academia think tank and research organization need to play a significant role in in enhancing better cooperation from the grassroots to the top level administrative unit we must formulate uh, under your uh, uh, you know able organization a uh, friends of cpac and i think mustafa is also here i'm happy to see him we can set up together your organization along with zones organization friends of cpac and that through academians should deal with the narrative and people like us should work on operation level you guide us how how to address that and wherever you need our support in terms of data because dealing narrative can be only through data through a live demonstration of the changes that is bringing otherwise you keep saying whatever you want to say they will they perhaps speak better english because their mother language is english so what we should do is demonstrate through illustration videos seminars where we come like chow bao chong comes and uh, showcase what we have achieved and how the regions are getting together and how we are benefiting so thank you very much and my apologize for taking 2 minutes longer than what i was assigned the <laughs> time is very right thank you so much mr hasan dawg really from practical experience and i think uh, uh, the way you concluded uh, we have the perfect uh, lined up uh, speaker next is mustafa mr mustafa uh, also doesn't require much of an introduction he's been uh, focused on think tank cooperation between china and pakistan for a very long time and uh, as uh, someone heading uh, especially international cooperation of the pakistan china institute has been able to uh, guide uh, a positive narrative and uh, positive media cooperation and think tank cooperation um uh, mustafa the floor is yours we are looking forward to hearing what you have to say on this topic yeah thank you uh, zoon i hope i'm pronouncing your name correctly um ccg uh, president wang uh, honorable riaz khokar saab such a pleasure 
Ambassador Masood Khalid Sahib, uh, friends from China, Hassan Daud Saab, my old dear friend, thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, and it's a pleasure to hear such uh, intelligent and wiser voices uh, earlier on. <clears throat> I'm going to uh, just uh, talk about one particular area uh, of the Belt and Road Initiative and CPEC and China's footprint in uh, South Asia. And before I do, I, I just want to say that I think I couldn't agree more with Ambassador Riaz Khokar when he said Asia Pacific instead of uh, Indo Pacific, because since when did India become part of the Pacific? When did this happen? Because I missed that moment. And I think that spin uh, should be checked by uh, the likes uh, of uh, people who understand this uh, regional politics. And it is Asia Pacific, it always was, and it should be. Uh, so that, that, that's very clear. W when we talk about media cooperation and think tanks, and when we talk of Pakistan-China cooperation, as we have seen by different speakers, there's so much that has been achieved in this cooperation. There's a lot to celebrate. There's a lot to uh, show to the world in this unique bilateral relationship, whether it is economic partnership now, before that, it was a defense and people-to-people -people bond, which is rooted in the peoples of Pakistan and uh, China. Uh, there was a Pew poll by the leading uh, survey think tank, which does polling uh, in Washington, that which country do, do people of Pakistan think is their best friend? And the, the, the result was China. And uh, the feeling is... Uh, you know, shared in uh, Beijing as well. But where I see a challenge is, where we need to improve is to, to telling that story of CPAC, to telling that story of those projects. And that storytelling, that articulation of narrative is not limited to Pakistan. It's limited, it uh, transcends onto the Belt and Road Initiative. It transcends onto other issues because we have nothing to be defensive about. And I feel that our narrative is reactive. When Alice Wells speaks in the Woodrow Wilson Center, we react. When a statement comes from Wendy Sherman, we react. When a paper comes from a Western think tank, which recently did on uh, financing of CPEC and loans, we react. I think that the narrative and the dissemination of our story has not been at par. And think tanks like the Pakistan China Institute and Zoom, I remember when you first met us and you, after that you <clears throat> dove in uh, 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 neck deep into the China, into the romance of China, it was the first uh, uh, CPEC media forum which we had in uh, China uh, with the China Economic Daily uh, about seven years ago, right? And that is what think tanks like PCI is trying to do, and we all are making that effort. But we, us, I, I was having a conversation with a, a high commissioner from a Western country over lunch, a couple of, uh, uh, about two weeks ago in Islamabad, and I'm not gonna name the person in the country. And he said, you know, Gwadar, I visited it, but you know, uh, it seems like there's gonna be a naval yard, a naval uh, shipyard in the future. And I said, Firstly, that it's completely economic as of now. But I said, if tomorrow Pakistan and China unanimously decide to have a naval shipyard, what is wrong with that? How is that uh, uh, something which is a red flag for anyone? There are countries which have 800 bases uh, all over the world. So if Pakistan and China in the future have a uh, uh, something which they think is in their national interest, shared national interest, and have a shipyard of the Navy, uh, Navy. What's the big deal? So it was just a hypothetical conversation. But there is this uh, skepticism, suspicion, what is really happening in CPAC? Why Pakistan is getting a sour end of the deal? Why is Pakistan doing it? Pakistan is going in debt, where, which is not evidence-backed at all. We have about $4 billion or $5 billion owed to China, in our total debt, which is predominantly to uh, Bretton Woods institutions. So 
they this this story and then when you talk about gwadar i met someone in beijing at the belton road first belton road forum his name was nasim and what a story it was and ambassador masood khalid was there i remember and the prime minister whole delegation was there at the belton road forum as well and nasim from gwadar was a local person who had never left balochistan let alone a uh, country and he uh, his father had donated the school to the china oc sport holding and the china foundation for peace and development for the gwadar girls primary school he then was given a scholarship to go to china and i look at his wechat stories his life has changed this boy from gwadar he is living it up in china he is is educationally transformed he has uh, he's very professionally marketable uh, he's seen the world he is residing in china he'll probably work in china and he is a glimmer of hope in gwadar for other students and people his age so that this is for example a story of cpec right because cpec is not just brick and mortar projects it is a, a large part of cpec is people to people connectivity similarly uh you if you go to thar and uh, pci had taken a delegation of parliamentarians and uh, media to the thar uh, uh, coal fired power project which is run by shanghai electric engro and the sindh government and we what was happening in thar there were women who before were not earning their own livelihood they were not financially independent now they are driving dumper trucks coal dumper trucks they are taking uh, coal from one area from the mine pit to the power plant and they are uh, earning a living they are earning a living they are earning a living and they are uh, financially independent and they are also supplying meals to the uh, workers in these project sites so a lot is happening but the, and there's a lot to tell so i think that story needs to be told better and more focus has to be done on that and i think it is time that we also stop the demonization of china china is being demonized and this is this has to stop why why does one country that decides to share its development model in terms of uh, projects infrastructure investments why does should it be demonized before it was uh, the soviet union then it was the islamic threat now it's the threat of the red dragon this is not acceptable and this has to stop and i think that uh, all the countries that are part of the belton road initiative and all uh, voices including uh, uh, a lot of uh, individuals in the united states in the west who are a uh, reasonable and rational are also saying that this is a time of collective effort to counter challenges that face humanity like climate change like the pandemic poverty alleviation so this is the time to unite rather than build walls it is a time to build bridges rather than building walls and i think that for pakistan at least during the covid-19 pandemic the glimmer of hope in our economy has been cpec we didn't have anything else going for us uh the only uh, major economic assistance and investment that happened in the past 2 years in pakistan from abroad was the china pakistan economic corridor and that is the only uh, projects which were unimpeded and unhampered uh, during this uh, covid-19 pandemic so um, i think uh, i i leave everyone with this point that telling telling the story is very very important we need to tell the story better and i thank uh, ccg uh, and uh, my friend zoom organizing this and look forward to further uh, interactions and dialogue with ccg and with other friends thank you very much thank you thank you so much mustafa that was mustafa had to say it and really um, uh, mutual understanding better narrative building better communication uh everything you said was insightful and we look forward to more avenues more more ways and opportunities to cooperate now uh, we we really are very over time uh we have uh four more speakers 
And uh, let's firstly invite Mr. Ben Harburg. Mr. Ben Harburg is a managing partner at MSA Capital, a global investment firm with over $2 billion in assets uh, under management. And actually from China, he is one of the key investors uh, in Pakistan. So Mr. Ben, it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, the floor is yours. Please try to stay within uh, five minutes. That would be uh, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Sure. Thanks for having me. Um, uh, here to talk about something slightly different than the rest of the panelists, um, in the sense that this is is this is an apolitical, purely commercial um, narrative uh, in in how we see the Chinese uh, the Chinese engagement with uh, uh, the technology ecosystem of Pakistan. And um, you know, Pakistan, it, it maybe even unbeknownst to, to many of, of those on the on the call today, is actually one of the most exciting technology ecosystems globally right now, attracting uh, more capital um, and, and at, a, at a faster pace than many other emerging markets. Just to put it into context, uh, just uh, just two years or so ago, there was about ten million dollars of VC investment into the Pakistani tech ecosystem. This year, we're going to see about three hundred million dollars. Uh, and the capital that's flowing into the Pakistani technology ecosystem is coming from global blue chip investors. So uh, names like Kleiner Perkins, uh, Naspers, which was an early investor in Tencent, if you know that name, uh, Tiger, uh, First Round Capital, Stripe. Uh, and, and so um, uh, it's, it's really bucking all trends in terms of uh, leaping rungs on the evolutionary ladder of, of VC and technology ecosystem development, even relative to its much wealthier neighbors, uh, particularly the other kind of components of, of, of the Middle East venture uh, capital ecosystem like those in the GCC uh, and North Africa. Uh, and uh, and it's, it's pretty fascinating how this has occurred. Um, I also think this is a really unique opportunity for China uh, because uh, Pakistani technology companies uh, in many instances, are more interested in adopting the technology models popularized and pioneered here in China than they are those emerging from Silicon Valley. And so in that sense, China is a better exemplar and a better uh, capital as well as a strategic partner for technology companies in Pakistan uh, than the West. Uh, there were early inklings of this, as some of you are aware, uh, uh, Alibaba acquired one of the largest e-commerce companies in Pakistan called Duraz. Um, uh, Ant Financial also is a, a majority investor in Easy Pesa, which is one of the largest telco-backed um, e-wallets in the market. Uh, but other than that, actually, my firm is one of the very few uh, kind of China heritage firms uh, that have investments in Pakistan, and we do so for purely commercial reasons. Uh, we have no government money or any other um, uh, state-level incentive to do so. And I think that technology investment is, is frankly, more uh, compelling in many instances uh, and more sustainable for many components of the, uh, the long-term health of the market because we're training people, we're building businesses that will train future generations of entrepreneurs. Uh, and unlike a, uh, an infrastructure project, which once built uh, might, might shed its workers, these companies are, uh, uh, are scaling massively and are spinning out kind of through network effects and, um, and again, through the alumni that they build um, one of uh, a, a, a hugely powerful uh, network uh, that will ultimately, I think, reshape uh, the, the Pakistani technology market. And so, um, um, I think I guess just you know. You're, you're probably aware of this, but our um, uh, there. Your voice was breaking. I think now it's fine. Please continue. Okay. Um, to support entrepreneurs in uh, in the Pakistani market, um, and uh, obviously one of uh, a lot of other really compelling statistics, like a uh, a 78 million uh, person broadband user uh, and one of the youngest populations globally. And, and so, um, you know, as, as a firm, one of our key uh, um, impetus is how do we take Chinese models and apply them to the Pakistani market? If you look at a Pakistani leader like Baikia, which is kind of the ride hailing leader today, uh, if you ask their founders uh, who their inspiration is, it's far less Uber and far more so a Meituan or a Didi. Uh, and if anything, um, uh, Baikia today is a replica of a Southeast Asian company called Gojek which again has been heavily financed and influenced by uh, Chinese uh, models uh, in building not just a ride hailing app, but also a, 
ecosystem of services. So food delivery, um, uh, other home services, and ultimately financial service products. Uh, and so we as a firm have uh, begun aggressively investing in the Pakistani market. We've done five deals just over the last year. And what's stunning to us is that the deals we've done in every instance have attracted a huge amount of global capital thereafter. So we, for instance, invested in a company uh, doing kind of a kata book model or um, uh, tools for SME retailers like bookkeeping. Uh, we invested in a company that solves kind of cash on delivery. So helping uh, e-commerce players to resolve a lot of the challenges that relate to a population that doesn't have ubiquitous mobile payments and strong last mile delivery. Uh, we've invested in a quick commerce company that provides 10 minute delivery of groceries uh, and services. And frankly, these are some of the most compelling companies in our portfolio today across the world. And we index from Brazil to, uh, to Indonesia and everything in between. Uh, and so I would encourage everyone here to uh, think about how they can engage further in the technology ecosystem in Pakistan. And we'd be very happy to collaborate with you on that effort as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Benjamin Harburg. Uh, really, this is, uh, uh, Pakistan is one of the youngest populations can be a very uh, key destination for Chinese investors. And uh, the work that you described, uh, especially that five deals have been signed uh, within the last year, I think we can have uh, opportunities to cooperate and share this experience, uh, see how we can better untap the potential of enhanced infrastructure in CPEC following models that are, that are successful so far. Thank you so much. Up next, we have uh, Mr. Johnson Liu, and then we will have Professor Chen Feng from Chenghua University. So uh, Johnson, the floor is yours. Uh, Johnson is an old friend, and he actually, uh, what I'm going to introduce him as right now is he led a, a student delegation many years ago to Pakistan from Chenghua University. They explored uh, the developments under CPEC, and currently Johnson is involved in different investment projects and uh, things about uh, uh, better ways for Chinese investors to go overseas. Johnson, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Zuin, um, and thank you so much for the invitation of CCG. Actually, uh, five years ago, I was working as an intern in CCG, and we were talking about having more such dialogues ah. with our friends from the developing countries. And today, uh, you know, it comes true. Um, so good afternoon, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so I am Johnson, a recent graduate from the Schwarzman Scholars Program in Tsinghua University, and also a young entrepreneur uh, working in the cross-border investment sector. So I would like to share today from these two uh, perspectives. Uh, firstly, uh, please allow me to share my screen and you know share my story of uh, leading the delegation of Tsinghua Universities. Are you able to share your screen right now? I think so, yes. Can you see? So uh, it was 2019. Um, so uh, at that time, me and uh, several other Tsinghua students uh, co-founded an organization called Student Association of Belt and Road Initiatives. Um, so and one of the first sort of uh, field trip project was to Pakistan. Um, so we led students of 20 uh, and in cooperation with the University of Lahore, uh, we went to several places and meet with many, many interesting partners uh, in Pakistan, mostly in Lahore. Um, so this is a photo of us, uh, you know, in front of the Wagga border. Uh, um, uh, you know, the, in, in, in Waga border. And we've also uh, been to the, the parliament, uh, the government. Um, we also uh, were, were on a student uh, uh, event that um, a local high school invited us um, to give speeches on uh, CPEC and Belt and Road. Uh, we also had a mechanism of uh, student exchange um, in the University of Lahore uh, with Tsinghua University. And actually this mechanism still exists today that uh, we facilitate student to student, youth to youth exchange in between two universities. Um, and uh, we also uh, went to several other companies. Uh, first of all, this is Hair uh, from Qingdao actually. Uh, they had a very large industrial park in, uh, in Pakistan. And uh, this was the Sahiwar uh, coal power plant. Um, also uh, 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 founded by a Chinese company um, so we, we have been to many, many different places um, in Pakistan as a student delegation. Um, so that's the first thing I would like to report, which is that, you know, um, in Belt and Road, we talk about five links. And one of the most important uh, link for, uh, among the five is social and cultural exchange. And one of the most important part for social and cultural exchange uh, is the youth exchange, um, how people and people, uh, students and students uh, can see each other. So as a young student organization, we have organized several uh, similar kind of trips uh, after that one. Um, and before COVID, we have done uh, four trips 
uh, by Chinese students going to Pakistan. At one point, we also uh, went to uh, uh, Port Water. Um, so before COVID, we were actually talking about having Pakistani students coming to China as well. Uh, but it was temporarily obstructed by uh, the, the virus. But we hope that uh, after the virus is gone, we can, uh, you know, uh, get those trips and uh, people to people exchange back. Um, so in this field, uh, I would like to say that there are a lot of positive news and people from each side are, are seeing a lot of um, uh, a progress in terms of uh, people to people exchange. Uh, that's the first thing I would like to share. And the second thing I would like to share is related to my work, uh, which is also related to what uh, Sir Benjamin, you have just mentioned on cross-border investment. Um, so basically right now, my company is facilitating Chinese VCs and internet firms in their investment overseas, uh, also in the uh, internet sectors in local countries. Before joining Tsinghua University, I was actually working as an investment um, uh, associate in a, a Delhi-based uh, venture capital firm uh, in India. And we were facilitating uh, Chinese investment into India. Um, and uh, if you know the Indian story, it was quite exciting uh, in the internet sectors. Uh, but before I talk about that, I want to uh, share something about the, the Pakistani uh, market right now. As uh, Benjamin has just mentioned, uh, actually this year uh, you, you, you witnessed uh, around 300 million uh, investment into Pakistan. Uh, even though compared with other countries, that number is still very tiny, but it's uh, um, the, the largest investment amount uh, for Pakistan in years. And also the, the potential for, for uh, Pakistani market is great uh, because two thirds of the 200 million population are under 30 years old. And most shopping is still done in cash and relatively few people have a bank account. Um, so the internet and internet users have more than tripled in the past five years to about 110 million people right now. So all these are very good potentials for the internet sector to boom. Um, actually, that come true. Uh, company like uh, BridgeLinks, uh, quick e-commerce startup Airlift, uh, e-commerce platform Bazaar, uh, has all uh, accumulated a large amount of investment this year. Um, and it is estimated that the current collective market cap for all Pakistani startups uh, to be between 1.5 billion US dollars and 2 billion US dollars. And it's also expected that um, this number will rise to around 30 billion US dollars by 2031. Um, so after years of lagging behind, now Pakistan market is catching up. And there are a lot of reasons behind. Internationally, um, the reason why money, money are coming to Pakistan through VCs is primarily driven by the fact that interest rates in countries like Pakistan are very low, which makes traditional uh, investment options less attractive. And for domestic reasons, um, you know, uh, the success of Pakistani's first startup wave, like uh, the launch of Food Panda, Kareem, uh, the Ras, the success of those companies provided the capital and know-how for the current generations. And I would like to emphasize the China reason, which is, first of all, we believe in the theory of the, the time machine theory initiated by Mr. Uh, Masayoshi Sun, um, that you should find uh, a similar China uh, in other countries, uh, countries like Indonesia, India, or Pakistan, which resembled uh, China like 20, 30 years ago, and um, is, is waiting for our development, is waiting for investment. And the second reason is that there is a tech crackdown uh, or tech regulation in the Chinese market nowadays. You see more government regulations on companies such as Tencent and Alibaba. And third, most important reason is that uh, there was a crackdown in India, uh, a ban of APPs, of Chinese background APPs uh, last year uh, in India. So the investors, um, the capitals are looking for other countries and other market to invest in. And Pakistan is right there. Um, so that's why a lot of Chinese investment would like to go to, to Pakistan. It's an environment they are, they are familiar with, and it's an environment that is brand new for them, and is an environment that is big enough for the investment to grow. Um, so briefly talk about the, the Indian story. Uh, if you know that in 2016, the investment was around 2 billion US dollars, but in 2019, just three years later, it grows to 8 billion US dollars, so very fast. Uh, very famous investment parties like Forsun Group, CDH Investment, Shunwei Capital, or internet giants like Meituan, Betadance, um, all have invested in India in just a, you know, a few years. And sometimes they were competing. For example, in a similar sector in China, the food delivery sector, uh, companies like Meituan and Tencent would invest in companies similar in India uh, called Swiggy. And then Alibaba would compete for that investment in another company called uh, Zomato. So we see this uh, competition got intensified uh, outside of Chinese market in another uh, country in India. And we, we are also probably going to see that happening in Pakistan too. But this is not to say that China this only happens sector. after COVID. Uh, actually, before COVID, we already see a lot of uh, investment going on in Pakistan. You know, Benjamin has mentioned about ePesa, uh, a Shanghai-based uh, uh, investment uh, venture capital called Gobi Partners uh, was a, 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 a joint uh, had a joint venture found with um, the uh, Fatima Ventures in Pakistan. 
for uh, 1.1 billion uh, US dollars. Um, so things were looking very good, but there are also a lot of problems. Uh, number one problem is still lack of information. Uh, both sides don't know much about each, uh, each other, and there are very few media coverage about what's going on in the uh, cross-border investment sector. Um, so even though the Chinese investor would like to look for opportunities in Pakistan, uh, there are very few professional knowledge that they could, they could use. And also for the Pakistani projects, uh, naturally, they will still look for uh, Silicon Valley investment or investment from the Middle East. It's not very natural for them to go to Shanghai, Beijing, or Shenzhen to look for, for investment. So it would be better if we can have more media coverage in the sector and then uh, have more uh, you know, Chinese investors know more about what's going on in, in Pakistan. And secondly, is that um, we would hope that incubators, accelerators from Pakistan to have an internal review mechanism so they first select projects from Pakistan um, that they think is um, good enough, have a great potential for growth, and also have a similar business model with, uh, with companies in China. And then they can bring those projects to Chinese investors. And then the Chinese investors would trust these uh, incubators and then invest in these projects uh, afterward. Because it, it would take a lot of cost for the Chinese investors today to go to Pakistan and actually check on all those projects one by one. Um, so overall, um, these are um, the things I would like to share. And uh, thank you so much for uh, the invitation again. And I uh, really great hope for the for the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johnson. Really, um, so we uh, we have a better understanding. And not only did you talk about the importance and successful ways of doing youth en uh, engagement uh, on both sides, but also what are the sectors, what are the gaps, and how we can fill them. Uh, so we've talked about the broader idea of CFEC, key projects under CFEC. And from uh, uh, and from Mustafa about narrative building, and we also have more idea how to do tangible cooperation uh, in different sectors, uh, specifically between both sides. Now let's warmly invite Professor Qian Fang, who is Director of Research and Development and Senior Research Fellow at the National Strategy Institute of Tsinghua University. Professor, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you are an expert on the region. And we are really looking forward to understanding the Chinese perspective on uh, developments in the region and how our countries can cooperate effectively. The floor is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dong. Yes. Uh, thank you, CCG, for inviting me. Yes. Uh, distinguished friends. Good afternoon. Salam alaikum. Yes. Every time we have a meeting with Pakistan friends, I learned out, uh, a lot of more for a lot of more, uh, courage the hope and the friendship is. Yes. When we talk about uh, the Chinese foreign policy perspective, yes, uh, and, uh, uh, yes and the region, we back uh, though, yes, the core of the Chinese current foreign policy, yes. In my opinion, yes, the Chinese current foreign policy's core objective is to how to safeguard the China's sovereignty, security, and uh, the development interests, and create a more uh, favorable and the develop and uh, international and the regional uh, environment for Chinese rice, yes. And safeguards and the extent the import in the important period of uh, strategic opportunities uh, for development and provide support and uh, guarantee, yes, uh, for the realization of the national, yes, regulation. And, uh, in, in short, yes, measures include, but not uh, limited to, yes, the first one, Yes, uh, improve the, the global diplomatic lay, layout and build a global partnership network. And number two is promote the construction of the BRI and deep, deepen the pattern of all around open up policies. And the third is uh, the actively and deep, deeply participate in the global uh, governance and actively uh, uh, guide the directions of the international order. Among them is Deeply, yes, relations with our China, uh, our Chinese neighboring countries is very important part of Chinese diplomacy. Yes, uh, yeah, uh, South Asia is not only important part of Chinese uh, surrounding areas, but also is one of the regions with highest integration of Chinese traditional security and also long traditional security interests. It is particularly as important to China's national interests. I mentioned the five points, yes. The one is the sovereign rights and the ter territory rights. Of China's uh, 14 na uh, neighbors on land, only India and, and Buddha has no form of the borders with China. Uh, China is committed 
is to fairly and reasonably and properly re reserving the territory disputes and safeguarding sovereign and territory integrity. Uh, this year, China and Bhutan yes, have taken an important uh, step yes, in reserving our uh, border uh, issues. Uh, but for India, as Panic San Fran knows, there's a still a long way, very long way to go, yes, uh, before we solve the border issues. Uh, because due to the large uh, areas of dispute and also the low level of the mutual trust. And number two is the frontier security. The South Asia is, uh, yeah, South Asia borders Xinjiang and the Tibet, the largest two, yes, in China. And it's related to the security and the large, yes, the ethnic unity and the social stability, yes, in China's both areas. Uh, on this issue, I think that China has been committed to, to, yeah, to fighting the so-called Tibetan independence uh, forces and also the ETIA and terrorism and striving to prevent the spear over um, yes, of terrorism from international and, the region, uh, and the regional yes, of Asia. And yes, uh, especially yes, uh, the South Asia, uh, the Afghanistan, yes. Uh, and uh, third is the channel, the channel safety. Yes. Uh, South Asia, this region is a major channel connecting uh, China with West Asia and the uh, Middle East and the, to the Indian Ocean. The, propose, the proposal of BRIs has both a new opportunities for the development of China-Pakistan's relations. Over the past eight years, the CPAC is the most outstanding achievement marketed in China-Pakistan relations under the new circumstances. This is of a great importance for further expanding China-Pakistan uh, economical relations, uh, further uh, strengthening yeah, the China-Pakistan's all-weather strategical cooperation partnership, yes, and benefiting the people yeah, uh, living around, uh, along the BRI, yes. The CPEC has entered now a new phase yeah, of a high quality uh, development after making significant achievements yeah, in, in a wide range of areas. Uh, there is no doubt yeah, that is joint maintenance yeah, of, yes, for the Pakistan and China yes, to yeah, safeguard this, uh, these channels security yes, in the future, uh, especially so many, uh, so many problems yeah, in, front, in front of us, yes. Uh, number four, yes, I think it's overseas interests. South Asia country with a large population and a large market potentials has become an uh, important direction of, for Chinese enterprises to go out globally, yes. Over the years, the economic trade cooperation between China and South Asia countries has made a great de development, which is uh, has covered a trade and investment infrastru infrastructures project, the service and other fields. And the cooperation uh, perspective uh, yes, are very bright. And China, the over overseas interest in South Asia are also yes, becoming uh, yeah, increasingly yes, broad. And the, the last is the stabilize of the neighboring areas. Uh, at present, the South Asia has evolved from the age of the major powers competition during the Cold War to an important field in the current competition between China and the US. In particular, the United States has gradually yes, incorporated South Asia in, uh, into its Indo-Pacific uh, yes, strategy and a direct coalition between uh, China and the United States in South Asia has increased, yeah. Our friends, yes, uh, today, I remember, yes, today's uh, 10th anniversary of, uh, uh, yes, uh, the NATO force, yeah, NATO force strikes the Pakistan post, yeah, and also uh, caused the casual, uh, many casualties. And, and uh, that action was condemned by, by us, yes. But it's also give us another, yes, yeah, reminder, the troubles and the disasters, so Americans caused to, uh, to us, yes. 
But now, after the withdrawal of the U.S. and forces from Afghanistan, it began to pursue the policy of supporting India and pressing Pakistan, which is becoming more and more obvious, which has further intensified the geographic imbalance in South Asia and objectively is enhanced and encouraged India's adventurous policies. In the face of this, these situations, China and Pakistan must strengthen cooperation and jointly safeguard our mutual, yes, mutual interests and also safeguard the regional peace and stability. Ah, uh, yes, uh, that's my word. And uh, uh, thank you again. And long live yes, friendship and uh, China, Pakistan, those things, Jindabad. Thank you. Jindabad, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Chen Fong. Really um, understanding uh, China's perspective, you talked about the entire region and how this is uh, an important time for both of our countries to deepen our cooperation and ensure that stability and more strength and better development uh, uh, move forward, moving forward. So now we have our last speaker for today, who is also going to touch upon the same theme, uh, theme as uh, Professor Chen Fang gave the Chinese perspective on Pakistan-China cooperation. Uh, we have now Mr. Ijaz Heather. Uh, Mr. Heather also requires barely an introduction. He was most recently executive editor at Indus News and hosted a, a policy show in focus. Uh, he started his career as a newspaperman and held editorial positions at the Frontier Post, Lahore, the Friday Times, to name a few. Uh, he has also been visiting fellow at the Brookings Institute in Washington previously. Uh, Mr. Jazz Heather, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, this was very informative. Uh, thank you to all the panelists, also to Center for China and Globalization, and certainly uh, Zoom yourself and Dr. Henry Wong for inviting me to this. Um, since I have about six, seven minutes, uh, I'll be brief and make a few points. Uh, of course, I mean, these points will also overlap with a lot that has been said previously. Uh, China and Pakistan are in many ways a uh, model of interstate relations uh, grounded in shared interests. These are two states and societies that are different in almost every respect. Different histories, different societal evolution, different systems of government, different economic trajectories, different languages, ethnicities, etc. And uh, I, I, I was silently chuckling when uh, you know, one of the speakers uh, talked about the hiccups and frustrations with reference to CPAC. And I believe some of those are also owed to these differences. That said, the two sides have over the past seven decades managed to forge relations that have stood the test of times, even as the world and the international security architecture have evolved not just around them, but have also impacted them. So what are those shared interests? Geography is one, obviously. We are neighbors. We managed back in March 1963 to resolve amicably our borders. This was no small feat. Most post-colonial conflicts today are about borders and right to self-determination. By settling the border, pending final settlement of the Kashmir dispute, which is internationally recognized, if I might add, China and Pakistan managed to remove a major irritation. Uh, contrast this with China-India border dispute in Ladakh and elsewhere uh, along the line of actual control and Pakistan-India dispute with reference to occupied Kashmir. Our second shared interest is the principle of non-interference. The third shared interest in which geography again plays a role is to act in sync with reference to evolving challenges in this region and beyond. China and Pakistan have acted in concert on international fora to support each other on issues of concern to both. The fourth shared interest is in enhancing security for both through joint action, whether it is with reference to hard security or a more broad and inclusive definition of security. Military relations, economic activity, social interaction, cooperation in developing infrastructure and health, education, energy, et cetera, have increasingly come to define china Pakistan relations. China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, the flagship of China's and President Xi Jinping's Belt and Road Initiative is a case in point. 
Other speakers more knowledgeable about it than me have already talked about the various aspects of CPAC. But it is interesting to note that this modern vision draws on thousands of years of trade routes between China and the region to its west, southwest, south, and northwest. The fifth shared interest is with reference to regional security. Here, events in Western Central Asia, as well as the Middle East, are of particular concern to both sides. Afghanistan is an ongoing concern where China and Pakistan are acting in concert, trying to keep that country afloat as it faces a growing humanitarian crisis. The presence of terrorist groups on Afghanistan's soil is a shared concern for both, as are attempts by certain state elements to act as spoilers. Peace in Afghanistan and South and Central Asia is also crucial for the success of CPEC. And this is where, and uh, Ambassador Riaz Kokal talked about the symbiotic relationship between geoeconomics and geopolitics. And I would say that this is where geoeconomics and geopolitics get locked in an embrace. Both China and Pakistan also have respective concerns and disputes with India. India's trajectory towards a masculine branded brand of Hindutva ideology is also a matter of grave concern for both Pakistan and China. China has additional concerns with reference to South and East China seas and the status of Taiwan. Since the term in office of former US President Donald Trump, we have seen growing attempts by Washington to stem China's modernization. That hasn't changed with the coming to office of President Joe Biden. The current US Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, has described the US-China policy as, and I quote from what he said, our relationship with China will be competitive when it should be, collaborative when it can be, and adversarial when it must be. The common denominator is the need to engage China from a position of strength. The recent virtual summit between Presidents Biden and Xi Jinping was a good development from the perspective of engagement and talking straight about what the two sides, US and China, consider their core interests and how they can work out a framework which reduces the chances of conflict and improves the prospects of cooperation. There is another shared interest between China and Pakistan. China is not interested in conflict. It wants trade and connectivity. It is the linchpin of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, the largest trade bloc in the world, and includes close US allies like Japan, South Korea, and Australia. For Pakistan, Conflict between the world's two largest economies flies in the face of Pakistan's desire for peace and cooperation and its reluctance to be part of this or that camp. Pakistan has a robust and resilient strategic partnership with China. It also has relations with the US going back to the formation of Pakistan. Pakistan wants the two sides to cooperate rather than getting locked into what has been called the securities trap. This is why Pakistan considers arrangements like AUKUS to have the potential for inducing instability. ASEAN states have also voiced concerns, not just with reference to AUKUS, but also Quad, and consider the latter to strike at the centrality of the ASEAN itself. Perceptions, of course, vary. Uh, Vietnam has been participating in pandemic-related talks with Quad members, but overall, most ASEAN nations remain suspicious of the four-country grouping. Finally, both China and Pakistan face a world that is fast changing at both the human as well as technological levels. At the human level, collections, states and societies are undergoing a transformation where the cooperative framework of globalization is increasingly coming into conflict with rising nationalisms. At the technological level, we are witnessing emerging and disruptive technologies whose employment is likely to have consequences that are still not very clear and could change interstate relations and state society relations in ways that might not entirely be positive. So going forward, China and Pakistan will be facing multiple challenges. Continued cooperation, as other panelists have also talked about, could help turn those challenges into opportunities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Jas Heather. Uh, I think this was, um, exa first of all, very informative, understanding the global realities. Uh, you also mentioned the China-US equation, um, how that can play a role for all, all parts of the world. I think we are, uh, we are cautious of how this relationship forms uh, in the future and what can exactly China and Pakistan do today 
uh, to ensure that we are at least getting the best of uh, this partnership and ensuring that it is a source of peace and stability in the future. So talking about the existing threats and challenges and how we can cooperate uh, was the perfect conclusion to our panel today. So with that, uh, with uh, different dimensions of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, holistic China-Pakistan cooperation, and obviously celebrating the 70th anniversary of establishment of diplomatic relations between China and Pakistan, and looking at the way forward, we uh, talked about holistically, uh, what is the meaning of this relationship? Uh, what are the common challenges we face? And then bilaterally under CPEC, key projects, key progress. Uh, we also discussed the importance of narrative building, media think tank cooperation, and how different, uh, especially in the economic sectors, what are the trends that we need to look out for? What are the ways in which a young population and a dynamic uh, economy, uh, China's experience especially, can be beneficial for Pakistan. And towards the end, we had uh, two, uh, two experts talking about what are the challenges globally, uh, regionally, strategically that, uh, that both sides are looking at. And what we see is that there's a lot of uh, coinciding. There are many things that we face uh, together, that we perceive together, and that's why uh, the, the ways forward can be understood and avenues for cooperation can increasingly be enhanced. So uh, I will also lastly say that uh, as Center for China and Globalization, our, our mission really is to see how the world can cooperate in a better way, how China and the world uh, can coexist in a better way. We are living in a global village. And uh, even though there are differences in perceptions, the key uh, focus is dialogue and mutual understanding. And looking at the China and Pakistan equation, we can see an example of how both sides have mutual trust, mutual understanding, mutual respect, and are moving increasingly towards making this cooperation more tangible and beneficial in the end for ordinary people, because that is at the heart of the Belt and Road Vision. So I, once again, uh, on behalf of CCG, I want to thank all of our panelists, all of our speakers, who took precious time out, shared their valuable experiences and helped us understand what is this equation, what is the relationship. And we look forward to keeping in touch. We conclude our event today, but the conversation continues. Thank you all for watching and for participating. Goodbye for now.